Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Sweepstakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Welcome to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez, Brian Murphy with you here as we've entered the month of July already. We are through the halfway point of 2020. Thank God we are over the hump this year of hell, let me tell you. <laughs> I can't, I, you know You know something? UCF football was right on Twitter. We need, we need Randy Shannon to work this second half of the year. It's true. So at least the third quarter should... should probably be good going by recent history well yeah yeah we, we need a we need a strong we need a strong fourth quarter i think here to, to salvage this year anyway we've got uh, pl- uh plenty to talk about here special basketball episode for you so uh the basketball tournament uh is uh starting july the 4th this coming weekend and two ucf alumni are playing in it it will be televised on the ESPN Family of Networks starting July 4th. And uh, on day number two, Team Jimmy V is starting. And we have two UCF alumni playing for that team, Chad Brown and A.J. Davis. And lo and behold, both of them joined us, well, specifically Brian, here um, this week. So we'll hear from both A.J. and Chad and we also got some uh, listener questions that we will be getting to that we will be getting to as well, um, and uh, a couple of other grab bag things in the third segment. So uh, once again, you can follow us at blackandgoldbanneret.com. We are SB Nation's home for your UCF Knights. Follow us on Twitter at UCF underscore Banneret, Facebook.com slash Black and Gold Banneret, and you can follow us each individually at Jeff underscore Sharon. Eric Lopez Elo and Spokes underscore Murphy. All right, Murph, let's get right to it. AJ Davis um, kind of had some opportunities overseas and in the G League, but now he's playing for um, Team Jimmy V. They're, by the way, they're the 10 seed. They'll be playing their first game in the round of 24 on Sunday, July the 5th at 2 p.m. That game will be televised on ESPN. Um, during the round of 24, the top eight teams get a bye. They're not one of them, but um, uh, they will have the uh, they will play a team called Heard That, the 23 seed. And if that sounds familiar, it's because it's a team full of Marshall alumni. So old conference USA stomping grounds have it. But we start with um, AJ, and you uh, spoke to him first, uh, Brian. And you know, what is he? Uh, What's he hoping to get out of this uh, basically exhibition uh, where it's the first basketball we will have seen since the NBA shut down? Yeah, I think that's where the excitement for all a lot of these guys is coming from is just the just the desire to play basketball again in, in a in a in a um, you know a very a formal setting where it's competitive and and you know they're playing it's like it's like March Madness too. It's a elimination a style one and done type tournament. Um, and you get to go out there and you get to compete, which these guys haven't done since you know March or um, or maybe earlier in some cases if they haven't been in the G League. So I think for AJ, part of the reason to play here is just to fill that, just kind of scratch that itch. Um, but also, as we kind of got into it, I, I talked to AJ about um, his UCF days here, some of his his better his better memories playing for UCF, and really what he's done since leaving UCF. And I think that was probably the the most entertaining portion of this conversation that you're about to hear about AJ talking about what has really been a nomadic NBA, uh, nomadic professional basketball career because he has never played in the NBA. And I know when he left UCF, he wanted, we remember talking to him in like an exit interview in 2018. He talked about how he wanted to be one of the best. 
and maybe that won't well, that that won't pan out for him. And since then, he's played in the G League. He's also played in Europe over in Kosovo. He's played in Australia in Brisbane. He's played in Nicaragua. He's played in the Dominican Republic. Um, and and that sort of that sort of uh, of globe trotting, uh, I think, has really informed uh, the way he sees the world and has given him a new appreciation um, for 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 you know what basketball how basketball has influenced his life. Um, so here it is, my conversation with former UCF forward and current playing for Jimmy V player, AJ Davis. Because AJ, you're coming to us from Columbus. Um, and you're in the bubble there in Columbus, getting ready for the TBT tournament, which starts on July 4th. You guys play your first game on July 5th. Um, what ha- you know? What do you know about the the the, the restrictions and requirements and the and the schedule of things that you have to sort of be on uh, to make sure you're safe throughout this whole thing? Uh, you know, describe to me what that what that bubble sort of looks like to you. Uh, there's just a lot of precautions to keep everybody safe. Um, uh, when we first got here, we just had to take another COVID test. Um, we had to pass two COVID tests before we got here. Mm-hmm. Took another one once we got here. Um, once you kind of got to the bubble, you just um, got all checked in, got your gear, took your COVID test, uh, you know, just checked in. And then when you get to your room, uh, you just got to quarantine for the first well, until they get your test results back from the, the test you took when you got here. Um, so I think, I mean, with all the rules and the safety stuff, I think they're just trying to keep everybody safe. Um, you know, it's kind of a wild time right now, but um, I'm glad to, I know everybody's excited for basketball to kind of get back started. So, um, you know, just, just you know, basic precautions to, to keep everybody safe. Yeah, absolutely. And it, so many people in the, uh, in the elevator, I mean, there's, there's plenty of rules, but, like I said, they just saw to, to keep everybody safe. I think one of the more interesting rules with the tournament at large is that if anyone on the team tests positive, the team is automatically eliminated, um, which really puts a lot of emphasis on guys making sure they're doing the right things. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I think that once we start practicing and stuff, that's just another safety measure that has to be put in because of how... Um, you know how how this virus is spreading. Uh, I think you know once once we practice together, you know uh, if one guy has it, there's, there's a, a high you know probability that another guy has it. So I think they're just doing that to keep everybody safe, keep the whole whole thing going. You know the, if this thing spreads all throughout the tournament, then there is no tournament. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. Um, and the, the, the practice. They're just, they're just doing anything to to keep everybody safe. That's all. In the practice court, you guys are going to use is, is isn't there one inside the hotel where you're at in Columbus? Yeah, I'm pretty sure there is. We're staying in like a big, pretty big convention center, so I think there is a practice court here. Hmm. We haven't practiced or anything yet, though, because like I said, we have, we have to all pass our initial um, initial COVID test that we took once we once we arrived, like the registration mm-hmm. test. You passed the first two before you got there, I assume. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um, how did you get involved with, obviously, you know, you, you've known about TBT because former teammates of yours have played on, on this, uh, in this league. How did you personally get involved with TBT and playing for Jimmy V? Uh, I just signed with the new agency and, um, they pretty much connected me to, um, to the team that I'm on now, Team Jimmy V. Uh, UCF was actually starting, trying to start up a team called Team Kingdom. Hmm. Um, so that's the original team that I was on. Uh, but... They, uh, there were so many cuts with the tournament. They, it was harder for new teams to get in this year, so they ended up cutting that team. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I ended up with the team in Yeah, because normally these tournaments have like 64 teams or more than that. And then this year, because of the because of the uh, coronavirus, it's down to 24. So a lot of teams got cut. Who was on Team Kingdom? I, I've been looking through the list of teams that were ineligible and stuff, but I didn't see that team. So who was on that team? Um, Matt was the first person that actually... Um, you know, signed with that team. Matt Williams, uh, it was me. There was a couple of other, um, uh, uh, DePaul guys. Um, and then once we, uh, we had pretty much asked all, like, all UCF guys first, or the, you know, whoever was starting up the team, they asked whoever UCF guys first, but a lot of them were already committed to playing on teams. So, um, mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Chad Brown, who's now going to be your teammate on Team Jimmy V, was playing for, I think, yes. Florida TNT. Yeah. Florida TNT, yep. And uh, like you, their team didn't make it. But once the team doesn't make it, those players are eligible to join other teams that did. Um, yes. So what do you feel? What do you think about playing with Chad again? Uh, I'm excited. Chad, Chad's, uh, me and Chad have been close friends ever since uh, UCF. That was a close, close-knit group we had at UCF. So, um, you know, a lot of good memories, a lot of good times uh, me and Chad had. It's exciting for us to be back on the court, uh, court again, you know, together. Yeah, I know a lot of these teams want to have a lot of continuity. Uh, that's one of the big the, one of the big keys to getting these teams into the tournament is that these teams sort of have sort of have a familiarity with each other. So you have teams that are actually just all like Syracuse players or all Marquette players. Yeah, and, the you, alumni teams. Yeah, right. The alumni teams. So you have and you have some of that not only with Chad but I think one of your G League teammates uh, is it Josh Perkins yeah. or uh, not? Yeah, uh, yeah, Highsmith. That's sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, so. so G League. I played with him in summer league, um, but I definitely I'm um, familiar with him. Um, I'm, I'm friends with uh, Marcus Towns, so I knew a couple of the guys on the team before um, before coming to the team. And you guys signed. You guys added Hashim to beat yesterday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's not they, bad. They mentioned that that would probably that would be a possibility, but it, uh, nothing was set in stone and. Uh, I didn't know it was set in stone until until yesterday, until we signed it. So that was pretty cool. I think uh, I think it's cool that a lot of these NBA guys are coming and playing in TNT and kind of making this tournament a bigger deal, especially with um, everything kind of being slow right now. I think a lot of guys just want to get back to competitive basketball. So I thought it was cool that a lot of the NBA guys are coming to to come into play or at least thought about playing in TNT. Yeah, I mean, there's been some, there's NBA guys on the rosters, you know, like the, I, I just saw like Tony Roten was on a roster and, and a lot of other guys who have had maybe a couple of cups of coffee in the league. Do you get the sense of excitement among maybe guys you've talked to, friends in the in this league, in the TBT, the excitement that you guys have to just get back on the court and play basketball in front of a, a national audience? Yeah, of course. I think that's why so many people were trying to play in TBT. Um, then once they, they cut the teams and it got narrowed down, um, you know, I think you know, guys are just excited to have the opportunity to start competing again. Uh, mm-hmm. It's been a while. Everything's been closed down. There's been no basketball to watch. We've all just kind of been in quarantine and, and um, you know, just working out in our own little, little uh, you know, in our own little area. I think everybody's just excited to, to play. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I think a, a, a lot of guys have, you know, adrenaline pumping. There hasn't been any basketball, any sports really. There hasn't been anything. No, that was in wild times, and I think, uh, I think sports just do, um, you know, bring guys together and to compete and, and have fun and and you know play for the prize. Yeah, um, and you guys open up on July fifth against the uh, heard that it's the Marshall alumni team. Has there been any scouting? I know they've got some really good three point shooters. Uh, any any scouting on the herd that yet, or is that later in the week? Uh, yeah, we have we have a little bit of sounding so far. Mm-hmm. Um, we started to prepare for the game a little bit. Um, that's 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 what I've and I, that's what I've heard as well. Um, they have a lot of good shooters, uh, a lot of high IQ guys, um, and they play hard. Mm-hmm. Um, they they have a good team. I think that's the, the cool thing about TVT too is now that so many other teams got eliminated. You know, a lot of teams joined together and guys were playing on one team and now they're, they're playing with another team. So um, because the, the teams were narrowed down, like every team in it is is even stronger now. So um, every game in TBT is going to be competitive. I think every game is going to be a good game to watch. There's, there's a lot of great players in TBT. Yeah. I think this will be an exciting time for basketball. And not only that, but because of, you know, America didn't get uh, a March Madness this year, really. A lot of conference tournaments were canceled. The entire tournament itself the NCAA tournament was canceled. Um, so, and this is kind of this is kind of a small replacement for that because it's a bracket. This is a bracket setup, a, la- a single elimination tournament, uh, and you know how that you know how that goes. I mean, you've you've played in the NIT and conference tournaments, so uh, the the whole the whole added aspect of a single elimination tournament sort of brings an added level of of you know kind of desperation to this whole thing. No. Uh, yeah, for sure. I think the bracket play definitely makes it interesting. Um, I played in March Madness too, and I think nothing's like March Madness. Mm-hmm. My freshman year, I was uh, my team. Well, I was at Tennessee, and we went to the Sweet Sixteen. And I didn't, I didn't even play that much minutes, but just the atmosphere of 
of March Madness is 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 something else. So I hate that people had to miss out on that, but I definitely think it's cool that there's um that there's this bracket style of play where where uh, you know all the games are going to be broadcast on ESPN. I'm pretty sure, and um, that that everybody gets to keep up with the bracket. And, you know, pick what teams they like. There's a lot of different guys from different teams and um, you know different schools. So a lot of a lot of fans and, and people will be invested into watching it. And like I said, I think it's going to be an exciting time for basketball. Yeah. Um, is it going to be weird at all to play in, you know, compet- play competitive basketball without any fans? Does that sort of change, you know, maybe your 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 emotions, your attitude, you know, on the court? Because obviously players feed off of that emotion sometimes. But having no fans in the stands there in Columbus, will that make anything different for you? No, nah, I, I think just because basketball is back, I mean, there's a, there's a nice prize for the winner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I think the energy and adrenaline and, and everything is going to be high. I think it's going to be high energy games um, with or without fans. I mean, if we were playing a, a scrimmage for a million dollars, I think the energy would be high. You know what I mean? Uh, there's, there's a prize. Everybody's ready to compete. Um, you know, like I said, you no, know, everybody's just been sitting around waiting for this for an opportunity to compete at a high level. So yeah, the energy is definitely going to be high. The winning team, I, I well, each player on the winning team, I believe, gets a hundred thousand dollar prize. I think that's, uh, yeah, I think yeah. it's I think it's around there, depending on how many people you have on your team. Right. And uh, I, I want to say that it just went up to one point two million. I think they changed it like not too not too many days ago, or maybe the one point two includes the coaches, or I don't know exactly how that works. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it's 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 an amount around there. Um, yeah, that would make sense. Since you graduated from UCF in in twenty eighteen. Um, how would you, how, you know, just describe your basketball life because it has taken you to so many continents, different places, different cultures, uh, which I'll get into a little bit more. But overall, as you've gone through Europe, Australia, Central America, um, the Caribbean islands, describe your sort of basketball journey and really your life journey in the last couple of years. Uh, it's been it's been good. I think just to be able to travel to all those places and see so many different cultures, like you said, um, that's been amazing for me. Uh, I've literally seen like, geez, almost the whole world. It feels like in in a matter of two years, I've been everywhere. Um, the only place I didn't really go was Asia. Mm-hmm. So, um, not yet. Yeah. Not not yet, at yeah, least. Exactly. Not yet. Right. <laughs> um, so uh, just to be able to see how all the different, you know, the different fans of basketball, you know, uh, you know, different fans act different ways. There's different um, chants and environments. Um, it's just, it's just been fun. It's been, it's been super fun to travel and see so many different um, different things. And everybody there is, is brought together for the same reason, for basketball. So just to see how where basketball can take you in life and, and you know, how basketball can, can uh, you know, bring people together, it's just been a really cool experience. I would say that's what I've gotten out of it the most. You know, uh, I've made friends in other countries, continents. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, just, it's just been cool to travel and... and um, you know, it's it's been it's been exciting. It's been busy on the move and <laughs> and a lot going on. But uh, I've really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed the process of learning different cultures and try to take advantage of the the, the travel and the atmospheres and the environment as much as possible. Yeah, because in just in the span of maybe less than two years, you have you have worked worked professionally in you know so many different countries. It's uh, and for a man who's only twenty five years old, um, it's it's got to be a cool experience. I wonder. What if you could describe the differences? You talked about the differences in in how the fans react and the fans' involvement. Like, what's the difference? Like when you played in in Kosovo, as opposed to like fans in Brisbane, Australia, or you know, or fans in in Nicaragua. Like, uh, what stands out among the among the, the the cultures, the basketball cultures that you've 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 uh, worked in? Um, just well, one simply the language, you know, mm-hmm. like just how they communicate is is different. So, uh, you know, the people in, in Europe might be more aggressive than the people in, um, say, a Spanish-speaking country or um, just the, the communication is bigger is the, the first thing that I can think of more than anything. Um, when playing in those gyms and hearing different languages was, was a really cool, cool experience. Um, I would say that's, <laughs> that's the biggest thing. It's just the, the language, the, the how how people communicate, you know, just like mm-hmm. their tone of voice, their, um, you know, just how they interact is, is different. And I think that's just because of the, the language, the communication. 
of all the spots and all the cities and, and, and places you've uh, played, was there an area that you enjoyed the most? Maybe not for just the basketball, but for things outside of basketball, like just the city and the culture that you enjoyed maybe more than uh, other places? Uh, no, I can't really narrow down. Um, I, I think I found something in all of the places that I enjoyed and I liked because they were all different. Mm-hmm. I think that was the coolest thing was just seeing how different each play was, or each place was, you know, um, Nicaragua and the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico and um, Kosovo, Australia. Every every place was different. Every place that I went to was different. So um, hmm. it was just cool. It was just cool to see the difference in places, the difference in cultures, and um, I, I really, I truly enjoyed every place that I've been to. Yeah. When you go and 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 think about think about your UCF days, um, is there a game or maybe a moment that stands out? I've got two in my mind, but is there an ultimate one for you that stands out that that kind of encapsulates encapsulates your your UCF experience? Um, that's tough for me, man. I had I feel like a, I could remember almost every UCF game. I feel like <laughs> I, I loved them, I loved them all. I really enjoyed my time at UCF. Um, maybe the Illinois game, mm-hmm. uh, the Illinois game going to to the NIC. Um, that was that was uh, big for me. I, I'm originally from Illinois, so like I, I knew a couple of the other players, I knew a couple of the other coaches, and for me to to beat that team, like um, you know, like that year, uh, it was just big. I feel, I feel like it was big for the whole program. Like we were going to a post post tournament. Or, or post um, postseason play, mm-hmm. um, the uh, the Illinois State uh, game that year uh, that was a really fun game just because we we came back and won. Um, the game we beat Cincinnati was a big game. Uh, the game we beat Memphis at Memphis was the first time UCF ever did that. So I feel like just uh, at my time at UCF, um, like we we made some some progress. We made steps forward. Yeah. In any of those games where uh, you know they were big games and kind of an obstacle in just just UCF's history that we we kind of overcame um, was was a great memory for me. I, I have plenty of them. Yeah, the the Illinois game certainly is a is a touchstone moment for the program just because of the scene afterwards. Uh, just the the crowd, you know, the the court storming and then Dawkins addressing the crowd was was uh, was really amazing. Um, it was probably the best environment that. That I that I had ever experienced in a UCF game, in, in your college experience, even at Tennessee, where would that Illinois game rank as far as like just a, just sort of environment, you know, and, and fan experience? Um, like I said, it, it was great. Um, mm-hmm. It it would probably be number one for me. Yeah. I, I think like there there was other games that had better environments, but mm-hmm. that was like um, you know I felt like I was like at home with all my family. You know, like at UCF, we, I had grown up there pretty much. I, um, I had, uh, you know, spent so much time there. I had worked so hard there. Um, all the all the people in there, um, they had seen us grow, uh, you know, over time from the time we were at Donnie, with Donnie Jones, the time we were with Johnny Dawkins, to from when we were losing to when we were winning. Um, you know, a lot of those same fans were there from the beginning. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, same writers. Uh, same people, um, you know, working the games, the security guards to the announcers, you know, everybody had, had been there the whole time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, I guess that was like the coolest thing for me was we all got to experience that together. Like that was like a great moment for everybody at UCF, not even just the people, um, you know, not even just the people that's playing and not even just the players. It was, it was great for all the fans that had been there, everybody, everybody who had been a part of that process. It wasn't just just us. That was a huge moment. It was, it was a huge moment for the program. Absolutely. Yeah. That uh, the, the effects of which I think will be felt or still being felt. Um, I, the one game you didn't mention that kind of popped in my mind, and this is a game you guys lost. So I understand why you may not want to think about it, but it was the Wichita State game uh, in which you went off, hit six threes. You had the crazy uh, uh, bank three to force an overtime game. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Because that was, in my mind, your best personal performance. I believe you had 31 and 14 in a, in a crazy game. Yeah. Um, like you said, we didn't win, man. So for me, like, that's a, that was a tough one for me. Um, it was it was a great game. 
Um, it came down. It came down to the end. There, I made a lot of good plays, and I made some bad plays. You know, and that's that's all a part of the game. Um, you know, if I never played good in the first place, you know, the, the the bad plays that I made or the free throws that I missed or, you know, like that would have never mattered anyways. But uh, I just love winning. Like I always like put pride into winning. So for the, that game for me. Um, you know, there, there's games in my head that I that I had 10 points. There's games in my head where I had seven points, eight points, and we won. That meant more to me than that game where I had 31 and 14 and we lost. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I, I feel like uh, everything that happened at UCF was because we were winning. And um, I, I, I understood the value of winning. So, um, yeah, that, as far as a personal you know, performance, that was a great personal performance. Um, I'm glad that I had it. I had a lot of fun that game. But it just hurt, you know. It hurt to play that well and not not come up with the with the win at the end. Yeah, totally, um, under, totally understood that. I remember after that game, I tried to try. I tried to get you so hard to say that it was your best performance, and you just wouldn't really have it because you were so focused on the team aspect of the entire thing. And I, I get it. Yeah, I was always. I always felt like that was the most important thing. That's why I play. I, I compete to win. I don't compete to play the to score the most points. I don't compete to have my personal best game. I don't compete to any of that, you know, I compete to win the game. You know what I mean? I could have had zero points if we would have won the game. You know, I'd have been disappointed that I had zero points, but I, I would, I would still be happy because we won. Mm-hmm. So um, I put so much on myself that game. I had been so prepared. Uh, I was prepared for that game. I was ready for that game, and uh, I brought a lot of energy. I put everything into that game, and we lost. You know what I mean? So um, I've been going. I've been in a great stretch. I've been getting been in a great rhythm that uh during that time my the end of my senior year i just feel like i really figured it out i was really playing good uh good basketball but i just wanted i just wanted to win that game or i really wanted to win that game and uh i was just i was i was tired at the end i missed a couple free throws i think i had a turnover or something or, or a bad defensive assignment or something like that so i think about that in my head um well, actually, I did. I, there was a time I was supposed to switch at the end. A guy made a shot. Hmm. Um, there was a two free throws that I missed and a layup that I missed. So um, that that I mean, like I think about that in my head. You know, what if I would have made that? What if I would have focused more on those plays um, than even all the other things that I did? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I was all, I was just I just love winning. That's that's the best feeling to me. I, I love that. I love that sort of recall, that sort of minute recall. And you say you could do that with, with basically so many games in your college career, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's amazing. A um, couple last questions here. Uh, obviously, the world at large beyond the coronavirus is obviously there's so much of a conversation about uh, police brutality, uh, racial in- racial inequality, the fight for that, the continued fight for that. You have been outspoken a little bit about it on Twitter. And certainly in the NBA, there has been talk about players maybe making their own personal statements, uh, maybe having messages on their jerseys. Um, And although the TBT doesn't have the platform of an NBA, these games that you'll be playing in will be aired nationally on the ESPN networks. I wonder if there's been any discussion among teams and players in this league with the higher ups as far as maybe maybe things you can do with the platform that you guys will have over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I'm not sure. To be honest, I just I just joined TVT like a week and a half ago. Okay. So, um, I I didn't know after our team got initially cut. That was a while ago, and I, I was never sure I was going to be in in TVT at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I just recently found out that I was going to plan it maybe like two weeks ago or a week and a half ago. It wasn't too long ago, so I haven't really heard much much talk about it um, at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think any any athlete can use the, the platform. Um, you know, all all of the athletes in this are are um, you know playing somewhere else. There, there's a lot of high level players, known players in this in this tournament, and I think a lot of them are doing a good job of um, of speaking out on these things because just a lot of things in our country need to change. Um, and I think that's 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 the biggest thing is. Um, we as athletes are, are, like I said, basketball brings together so many people, and, and us as athletes have this platform to speak. And um, I think I think we all have to use it to a certain extent. Um, you know, it doesn't even have to be on social media. Uh, I'm not I'm not big on social media to be honest. With mm-hmm. you. I don't I don't really like social media that much. You know what I mean? But I, in these conversations with people that I know, 
um, educating myself, help other, help educating other people. I think that that's the um, the important thing to to help us provide provide a change in, in our country because I think it, I think it needs to happen and, and a lot of these things that are being said need just need to be said. Um, you know, the NBA is doing a great job because that is the biggest platform. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I, there, there, there's not a platform bigger than the NBA as far as basketball um, period in the world. So they're, they're doing a great job of speaking up. But um, as far as TBT, I, I, don't, I don't know if they've said anything. I don't know if they've, um, you know, done anything. But um, I, I feel like the players in it, you know, have, have big platforms. The play, there's big-time players in it. There's a lot of big names. And, um, you know, I think a lot, of, a lot of guys are doing a great job of speaking up and, and saying what they feel. Yeah. And I understand you may not have an answer to this, but is that something that you would, you would maybe bring up? Over the next week, and, and maybe ask uh, you know either the the GM or if, if you're allowed to make a statement or, or uh, you know a, a silent statement at best or something with your teammates, you guys could do a silent demonstration. Do you think you would you would ask about that? Um, I would definitely think about it. I don't matter of um, you know I, I think if we if we did want to do that, our, our coaches uh, and you know everybody that we're with would support us. Mm-hmm. You know, 100. Um, percent We we have. Uh, great guys around us. We have a great team. Like you know, we're the great people. Everybody with Team Jimmy V. So I, I definitely know they would support us. Um, right now, I think we're just focused on getting through this kind of whole quarantine and, and um, just kind of getting here and getting settled. And then um, you know, once we get together as a team, I think that would be definitely a topic that's brought up. It, it has to be brought up um, that we'll talk about it and we'll see how we'll go forward with it. Uh, from there, but yeah. uh, like I said, I think the conversation is is the most important thing. Some people are just ignorant, ignorant to it. You know, they 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 don't understand uh, the situation and what's what's happening in America. So um, I, I think just uh, any conversation about it and and um, bringing light to it is is beneficial. And uh, we we all we all haven't gathered as a team yet. We literally haven't even had a practice or mm-hmm. a huddle or a meeting or anything. So. Um, you know, after this, after we get through our safety precautions and kind of settle in and we start meeting and getting together, I definitely think that would be a conversation that we'll have. And then uh, my last question is for you, once this tournament is, is done, obviously, again, you know, the coronavirus dictates everything. But once leagues around the world, you know, basketball leagues around the world are, are, are ready to come back, uh, what is next for you after this tournament athletically? Do you, if you even know at this point? I don't. I really mm-hmm. don't know. Um, uh, like I said, I recently just signed with the new agency, so I know my agent is working and kind of seeing where, where people are, people's heads are at and like what what leagues will be starting back up and you know just kind of how things are going to be after this. Um, a lot, we just don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I could possibly be in the G League. I could possibly be overseas in Europe and Asia. I don't know where I'm going to be. Um, I'm just kind of weighing my options and taking it a day at a time, and making sure. Wherever I do end up, that I'm prepared for that opportunity, and the rest will work itself out. But you will be playing once it all starts. You will be playing, you know, willing, God willing, you will be playing somewhere. Uh, yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Things open back up, and uh, you know, obviously, I'm going to make sure it's safe. On, um, you know, I'm going to learn my options, and, and if I feel it's safe, and, and um, you know, things are under control, I, I think all of these safety precautions precautions are important. You know, we have to do this. Yep. Uh, just because even if you're somebody that can recover from from COVID easily, you might be around somebody else. You never know who who somebody else is around. You know what I mean? Like a person might live with their grandparents. And I think those are the people that we have to to think about, the, the people that um, if they do get this virus, they could really be at risk. Um, I think a lot of people are going to recover from it fine. But... I think we have to do a good job of thinking about everybody, you know? Uh, so that is something we're going to start back up and everything is safe and it, and it makes sense. Yeah. I'll, I'm, I'm gladly going to go play. If it doesn't, if I feel like it's not safe, um, if I feel like, um, you know, it's, it's just not a, a good, good, good option for me. Yeah. I won't do it, but I'm pretty sure I'll be playing somewhere once things clear, clear. Well, we hope that is possible and we hope you have, more amazing global experiences. Maybe you will get to play in Asia and sort of just circle the globe again. It'd be fantastic. Yeah, that, that would. I, you know, I, um, I just 
just hope to keep on getting better and, and keep on playing as you know the highest level that that I can. You know, if that's you know God willing, if that's Euro League or if that's uh, the NBA or wherever that may be, I, I just want to keep on playing basketball and keep on playing it at a high level. And um, you know, that's obviously my goal. I think every basketball player goal is to be in the NBA. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's there's so many different places to play basketball, and there's so many different uh, you know countries you can play and experience you can have it you just have to embrace your journey and, and, and enjoy your, your own process and uh, I definitely have I've been enjoying my whole process with basketball I think that's something important for people to understand because we have such a limited view of what uh, matters in sports as far as well if you're not playing in the NBA then your career is floundering like no it's actually it's actually not because you can go and play in these other leagues in other countries you can enrich yourself personally uh, and and become you know, the, the, the type of person you have become, which is a person who has traveled the world before the age of 25, 26. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't think of, like, most of the money that you're making overseas is not going to nearly be as taxed as the money that's over here. Mm-hmm. They're paying for, they're providing you with housing, they're providing you with food in most cases, a car in most cases. When you live in the States, when even if you play in the NBA, um, you know, you're paying for all of those things. There's always an expense that you're going to be paying for you're, you're, you know, you make a two million dollar. Uh, if you make a two million dollar, two million dollars in the states and two million dollars in, in overseas, overseas you're just putting it in a bank account and it's and it, you're not really using. It's not going to be touched nearly as much as if you're in the states. It's going to get taxed. It's going to you're going to buy a house. You're going to buy a car. You're you know you're going to be paying for a lot of different things when you're when you go overseas. You get to live in this whole other country. They pretty much take care of everything that you do. And you just put away money. So um, I think there's a lot of pros to going overseas. Yeah. Really, um, the, the travel, the the um, you know, just you're you're literally away working for nine months or however long, long it is. You know, there's there's different lengths to seasons, but um, I, I think people just get so caught up in the 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 um, you know the hype of the NBA and oh I got to be in the NBA to to show everybody I'm in the best league. Now, granted that, that there is nothing better than the, than the NBA, but you can still live a great, great life uh, playing playing overseas. You can have a really good life, a comfortable life. Um, you can make you know more than enough money to, to be comfortable to come home and invest, to come home and uh, you know to start businesses or whatever you want to do after basketball. I, I think you can still do every you know get all the money that you need overseas. Um, there's, there's been plenty of examples of it. And like you said, there's only so many spots in the NBA. Not everybody's going to be in the NBA. Um, you know, just embrace your own journey. And you can still live, live, you know, a great life uh, without being in the NBA. Yeah, and I think you live that. So, uh, well, thank you so much. You know, thank you so much, AJ. And uh, we hope you stay safe, uh, stay sane in the quarantine bubble. And uh, once, once things start here on July 5th, on the, on the ESPN network, uh, we'll be watching and rooting for you and hope for the best. Sounds good. Thank you. So there's AJ Davis talking about, uh, you know, what, what his life has been like since leaving UCF. And when talking about UCF, you heard him bring up there and talk in length about that, that Illinois, uh, elite, uh, that sort of, uh, elite eight NIT game, uh, back a few years ago with the court storming and, and just the emotion of that game. Uh, you know, for me, it was one of the first first uh, UCF events that I got to go to and sort of cover from afar when I moved back to Florida in 2016. Uh, guys, what did you what did you remember about that Illinois game that was so so amazing and so emotional? You know, Eric, when we both got there after the start of the game, right? I think that we were doing softball that day. We were softball was hosting number one Florida State That's right. that day. That was a five o'clock. And then we both walked together. We went to the arena. And I remember remember there was a lot of the the, the, the word on that was, hey, this is going to sell out. I think you and I were skeptical. We we're like, yeah, right. Yeah, right. I, I'm like, I'm like, I, I was looking for like, okay, are there any, you know, okay, sell out. Right. Maybe it'll so, sell out, but there'll probably be some empty seats. And then we walk in the building and yeah. it was completely sold out. I, I mean, I almost had, I almost passed out. Like I never thought I'd ever see the day and what I remember about that that game was how loud it was and how hot it was in that building. Like it felt like 
a sellout. Like it was, like there were ten thousand people in that building, and I just thought, man, this is this is the atmosphere we always wished for, and like here it is. And uh, and uh, there's no doubt in my mind. I mean, credit obviously to the players and the coaching staff, obviously, but there's no doubt in my mind that the crowd was a tremendous factor in that game. Probably helped UCF win the game more than any other factor, I think, especially down the stretch. Probably the most memorable home game that I could think of. I mean, that was, I'll never forget, Johnny Dawkins. After, the crowd stormed the court after the win. Johnny Dawkins is like in the middle of this, you know, all the fans on the court speaking to him. It was just Yeah, he a, jumped up in the student section. Yeah. We were right next to him. Remember that? Yep, yep. It was just incredible. One of my favorite moments there is they got to go to, clocked it up to go to New York for the Final Four. And uh, it was such a amazing run to get that place. They had beaten Colorado to get there. And then, you know, even in the regular season home finale, they had knocked off Cincinnati. This team was playing really well at the end of the year and really built that expectation the following year. Unfortunately, uh, they had a bunch of injuries that year that derailed them, and we had to kind of wait for the uh, that elusive NCAA tournament berth an extra year. But that NIT run was phenomenal uh, and, and really was the great start. For, really a heck of a job by Coach Dawkins. Murph, we've talked about it in the past, but they weren't expected to do very much in his first year. No, I mean, considering what he sort of took over, uh, when when you know Johnny Jones Johnny Donnie Jones departed, uh, and the fact and how just to see what jo- what Johnny Dawkins has taken uh, with what he started out with to now, and with everything sort of thrown in between of yes he had he had the the NIT Final Four, he also had a NCAA tournament win. In the middle there was this injury plagued year that really stopped what what should have been another probably tournament berth somewhere and and pro- and, and, and by the way well, I th- I said this before sorry to interrupt Brian but I thought that year was his best coaching job ever oh god they were yeah they, he was they, they, they had they, no they business were, winning 19 <laughs> games that year <laughs> right so to finish over 500 in that type of season uh again and they were patching things together every week with the guys going down and these weren't backups going down these were your star players who were hurt um so yeah no he's done a tremendous job but uh Maybe, you know, before really the VCU win, it was really that Illinois win that was, the, the I think, the marquee victory of the Dawkins tenure. And I think the the, the, the Dawkins speech from above that, that's above the student section to the to the, the, the supporters below on the crowd is probably one of the indelible moments of his tenure so far. No, no question. No question about that, Murph. And, you know, that year that all the injuries and you I know you talked to AJ in the interview about it. He kind of had, had a bigger role than maybe was expected because of the injuries. And you brought up that Wichita State game, which arguably was probably AJ's best game as a night. Yeah, it did. And, and uh, I, I wanted him to talk more about it. And I kind of knew he wouldn't because AJ is not wired like that. He's so much of like the team first kind of guy that he doesn't like the line to shot on himself. Uh, and he talked about that also in the in the interview, just generally about not you know uh, when he's playing for these other teams. It's all about the teams, not about me. So I, he didn't really want to talk too much about that Wichita State game because they lost the game. However, it was his best performance, and I, I I'm glad he was able to to at least acknowledge it a little bit. Uh, then when we come out, I think of the break, we'll talk to Chad Brown, and he does talk about a game that UCF lost, a very famous one, and I appreciate. it that because we needed to talk about it <laughs> oh god i wonder which that one is all right perfect segue stick around when we come back we'll speak with the other ucf night is playing for team jimmy v sunday july the 5th 2 p.m on espn you can watch them take on heard that in the round of 24 of the basketball tournament chad brown joins us on the black and gold banner podcast when we return don't go away today's episode is brought to you by cars.com With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to Cars.com. It's magical. 
All right, welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez, Brian Murphy with you. We heard from A.J. Davis in our previous segment, who's playing for Team Jimmy V in the basketball tournament. They're starting uh, their first game in the tournament July 5th. That's the Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. You can watch them both compete for Jimmy Team Jimmy V against Heard That, a team of uh, mostly Marshall alumni uh, in the basketball tournament, which is being held in uh, Columbus. Is that it? It's Ohio. They're all there now. Yep, Columbus, Ohio, they're Nationwide all, Arena. They're all they're there. The bubble. They're all locked in. This West, is this is like the West. this is like the dry run for the NBA bubble, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 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 kind of like that, except in Ohio, there isn't a massive spike in coronavirus cases. That's true. The uh, there are twenty four teams in the tournament. Winning team gets uh, to split a million dollars. So that's what's. Uh, at stake here. July 4th through the 14th is the tournament. Um, and uh, in addition to AJ, there's one more UCF player uh, playing for Team Jimmy V, and it's uh, Chad Brown, who played in the G League last year at the Texas Legends um, and is getting some run in uh, the basketball tournament. And Murph, uh, you spoke to him as well. It's kind of an unusual path, you know, because it's not like, uh, you know, NBA guys can just, or even G League guys can just leave and go and go play for uh, a basketball tournament uh, team because of their contractual obligations. But Chad found an opportunity to do this, right? Yeah. And I, well, what I didn't know until Chad told me in this interview is that Chad's a free agent. Um, I, I'm not sure how G League contracts work, but he is not beholden to the legends uh, or to the Mavericks. So he's look, he's actually looking and you'll hear him mention in the in the uh, in the art in the interview we're about to air. He's actually looking at the Orlando bubble, maybe you know, talking to his agent and seeing if there's any teams there that that need a, a, a backup power forward. You know, certainly as guys go down or opt out, um, there might be an opportunity for Chad there. So he's looking in there as well. So I think that's what allowed him also to to, to have the space and time to 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 enter this tournament. And and as we talked here, we talked about his time in the G League, um, doing a lot of Chad Brown things. I talked to him specifically about his favorite types of dunks. Uh, I talked to you know about him. I talked to him about looking at what uh, has happened with Taco Fall in the G League and the phenomenon that he's become. And he also talked at length about the Duke game from 2019. And I'm so glad he did because it's really hard to get players to open up about games that their team lost. We just talked about AJ Davis not really going too far in depth about the great showing he had against Wichita State because they lost that game. But Chad here really went uh, uh, talked a lot about the Duke game and how he has watched it and what that was like for him to to sort of watch clips of that game again. So here's my interview with former UCF power forward Chad Brown. Chad, thanks so much for joining me here. And uh, I know you you just got into Columbus yesterday. Uh, what's it like now as you sort of get used to living in the TBT quarantine bubble? Oh man, I mean it's 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 a little different, you know. You have to be able to, you know, find ways to keep yourself busy. You know, I've been watching a lot of film, um, and then you know, for the fun time, I've been watching you know a lot of Netflix, man, a lot of PS4, playing Warzone, Call of Duty, things like that, man. Just to, you know, keep myself busy and um, you know, just waiting for my test results back. Um, I've been tested twice, uh, both negative, both times, so that's a blessing. And, just waiting for my third test to come back again so you know i can get out of the you know the room a little bit but um other than that though man everything has been great what's uh what's in the netflix queue oh man i mean i, I watch a lot of like narcos in mexico mm-hmm. um watch a lot of uh i watch a lot of american horror stories stuff like that uh i'm, I'm a suspense guy so i like watching a lot of like action type of type of shows and things like that so uh that's that's pretty pretty much what I watch, man. All right, fantastic. Well, what went in for you personally? You know, obviously there's a commitment here you have to make about you know being in this bubble, being away from family and friends, loved ones for weeks. You know, for a few weeks here. What went into the, what went into you, the, making that decision for you? How did you know that was the right decision to make for you to go into this bubble? Uh, I mean, I, I think the biggest thing, man, is just to be able to play basketball again. Mm-hmm. You know, the season was cut short. Um, for the G League for me this season. And, um, you know, I haven't been able to, you know, play in a while, you know, as far as playing on TV and playing, you know, organized basketball. So, you know, just the opportunity came. And, you know, I, I, it is a sacrifice to be away from family and not being able to, 
you know, see my friends and everything like that. But, you know, sacrifices are, are worth it, man, when you love the game of basketball and you know, just being able to play and have the opportunity again, you know, I just see the moment. Yeah, and we'll definitely get into your Texas Legends time this season. But uh, with with playing for Jimmy V specifically, you you started out on another TBT team that that didn't qualify. Florida, I think it was Florida T and T, correct? Correct. Right. So this you know the tournament has a lot of teams that that enter, but only a small number this year could enter because of the, the of the virus. Only twenty four teams could enter. So joining joining uh, playing for Jimmy V. Talk about the maybe the conversations you had with. Uh, with their GM, Alex Newman, or, or, you know, or any people you knew on that team as far as why you wanted to join that team? Yeah, man. So when I realized and found out that our, my original team, Florida TNT, wasn't going to be able to make it, um, you know, I got a call from, you know, uh, Alex Newman and um, um, one of the coaches, uh, Benny, he uh, called me as well and you know, those guys asked me if I wanted to play, man, and, and you know, I was just excited. I was mm-hmm. excited to be able to still have a chance to play, and I know a couple guys on the team already. Um, Josh Perkins, he played for Gonzaga last season, and uh, this season with me with the Texas Legends. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know him really well. Um, I know a couple other guys. Uh, Haywood Highsmith, he played with the 76ers um, two years ago, and I played with him in Uruguay in the G League uh, elite team for the USA. So um, I know a couple of those guys. And, you know, just playing for Jimmy V, man, I think it's a big opportunity. Uh, what it stands for, you know, cancer. Because, um, you know, me personally, I have family members that have passed away for cancer. So it's personal for me. And, and I'm excited to, to represent playing for Jimmy V because I know what it stands for. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there's, there, there are other teams in this tournament who are playing for causes. We've got a couple of teams that are playing uh, to help the fight against cancer. We've got a team that's helped to uh, to fund research for ALS. Um, you know, and you talked a little bit about it, and I think a lot, so many people can so many people can relate with cancer. It affects everybody, and no matter who you are, you know someone uh, who, who in your family who has either had the disease, is battling through it now, or has passed away from it. Um, how much of that, how much of your, did your own personal experience of how cancer has affected your family kind of go into you choosing this specific team? Uh, I mean, it was huge. You know, I, I, I had a grandmother that passed away from breast cancer and mm-hmm. um, she, was, she was really close to me. And, um, you know, when those guys called me to, to play, um, you know, I just said, you know, it's just that the opportunity is just huge. You know, it's first to be able to you know, play basketball again and be able to play on the big screen again and everything like that. And then also what it stands for, you know, it just, everything was just, was the right fit. And I was excited, you know, I was excited for when they called me and I'm ready for the opportunity. And this tournament, which uh, gets underway on July 4th, but you guys play your first game on July 5th, it's going to have that March Madness type feel to it, right? I mean, you know how this goes, but single elimination, uh, you know, tournament uh, and, and, you know, so what, what kind of uh, you know? How does that how, how does that change? You know, your, maybe your normal outlook from playing seasonal basketball to when you know it's one and done. How does that change? Maybe your your attitude, your approach. Oh well, me. Well, it doesn't change my mentality mm-hmm. at all. I, mean, I, I take every game as if every game is the last game, and, that, and that's just the way I play, and I've always played like that. And well, like you said, though, man, it's a playoff mentality. Um, single game elimination so I think me and the other guys know what's at stake and you know I, I feel like you know everybody has the same mentality like it's either win or go home so everybody wants to stay and I believe the competitive spirits are going to be really high and I'm just I'm excited to compete man I'm excited to compete and play against you know a lot of really good talent in the TBT this year so it's, it's going to be a great opportunity and then also to be able to play on ESPN where the whole world's going to be watching, so uh, I'm excited. Yeah, because again, there's not a whole lot going on, and so it's nice that ESPN can carry some live sports, and then people will be certainly tuning in to see you. We talked about you talked a little about the the guys who you know, Josh Perkins, who played with you in the G League, and and you guys um, actually signed Hashim to beat yesterday. That's an interesting pickup uh, uh, yeah. to play in the post, but obviously, you know, you playing with AJ Davis again. Talk about what that means for you, how fun that's going to be. Oh, it's going to be great, man. It's going to be great playing with AJ again. Uh, AJ's a really good player. Uh, I love playing with him at UCF, man. He's a versatile guy, guy that can, you know, play a lot of positions. And, um, 
and it's just gonna be exciting to play with him again, man. It's just gonna, you know, take it back to college days. You know, he's 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 a player that that's a competitor as well and wants to win. And you know, when those guys told me that they signed AJ as well, you know, I was excited. Hmm. You know, that's my former teammate, and you know, we have so much chemistry on the court, and now I'm ready to play with him again. You guys, I assume, keep in touch off the court too. I mean, it, this isn't like your friendship went away after your you, your oh, careers no, ended. No, 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 absolutely. We, me and him, we, we definitely stay in touch. Um, we both be in the Orlando area off season, so we get to get get together, uh, play pickup games together, and stuff like that. Hang out. So you know, we have good chemistry on and off the court. Uh, and we have we actually travel together to the TPT. So we uh, so we have good chemistry. We always had. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Uh, this season, obviously, your first season in the pros, playing for the uh, the Texas Legends, the Dallas Mavericks G League affiliate. Uh, how would you assess the the forty two games that you you got to play this year? How would you assess your experience as a pro player? Uh, I think I think it went well. I think it went really well. Uh, I learned so much um, playing in the G League this year. Uh, with the Texas Legends, they're a great organization. The Dallas Mavericks is a great organization, class act. Um, and and, and I, I feel like I got better. I got better. I learned a lot. Um, learned the pace of the game. It's much faster than college. So um, I had to change, you know, the way I play, which 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 led to my advantage because I'm a high-tempo player anyway. So it kind of led to my advantage. And, you know, I feel like it helped me a lot this year playing in the G League, you know, playing – against unbelievable players, man, uh, playing back-to-back games where the games are just nonstop, so you have to train your body that way. So uh, I feel like it was it was definitely a great year, great season, and you know I'm excited for the future, man. I have you know great opportunities ahead, so I'm, I'm excited. In what ways did you see your game evolve as you tried to keep up with the faster pace in the different game? Uh, I think just my IQ. Mm-hmm. My IQ being able to you know, handle pressure, you know, being able to, you know, dribble the ball a little bit more, you know, the Mavericks and, and the Legends have a system where, you know, it's not really about bigs posting up, you know, it's more about bigs handling the ball, you know, bigs shooting the ball, you know, bigs pushing it on the break. So, you know, I, I felt like it, it definitely translated my game and I was able to, to, to get better in, in those areas. You yeah. Know, and that's, that I took serious and I worked on it every single day with, you know, my coaches, um, you know, Eric Snow was one of my assistant coaches. Um, uh, Jason Terry was on the staff with us this year. So a lot of NBA veterans, I was on our staff too, that, that helped me get better this year. Yeah. And, you know, in the, in the G league, you know, people know what kind of player you are. And I think you brought exactly what everyone was expecting, which is, you know, six rebounds in, in, in about 18 minutes per game average. Uh, we get blocks in there. We get, just get some hard nose play. But of course, we get dunks. Uh, and so I'd like to ask what your favorite type of dunk out of these two is. Would you rather have like a clear lane for you to just go as hard as possible at a, at a, cl- at, you know, at a clean rim with maybe a, a one hand or two hand jam, or is it better to catch a ball in midair and finish off an alley oop with authority? Which of those two would you rather have? Oh man, uh, ooh, that, that's hard to pick. That's hard to pick. I, I think, I think getting in the air for me. I think getting in the air off the of alley for me is, is probably my favorite because I get to show my elevation. You know, I get to show my my footwork of setting a screen and rolling far to the rim. And then also running the break on a fast break, too. I get to show my athleticism on how high I can catch it when a guy – because, you know, not every pass is a perfect pass. So, you know, guys might throw it higher than usual. But, mm-hmm. you know, I feel like I'm a guy that can catch pretty much anything. So uh, it just shows my athleticism a little bit more. So that's – that's I think that's my favorite type of dunk, man. Yeah, absolutely. We know you can go up and get anything. Um, in the G League, obviously, the story of the year really in the G League, G League was Taco Fall. Um, so I have to ask, as a person not only playing in the same league as him, I know you didn't face him, but playing in the same league as him, as a, as a teammate of his formerly, what was it like to see Taco transform into a sort of a G League phenomenon and NBA fan favorite this year? Oh, man, it was amazing. I mean, even in the summer league, man, you know, me and him was both in summer league, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, me playing with the Magic and him with the Celtics, man, you know, we, you know, we hung out and just go around and stuff or Vegas and, you know, you just see all the people and fans just want to take pictures with him and things like that, man. And, and it's just amazing because, you know, he's, he's a guy, he's such a good guy that he 
he's never said no to one person taking a picture. Mm -hmm. And it's hundreds of people that come up to him daily. And, and, you know, you you see a guy like that, you know, and it just shows his character and who he is. And it was great to see him develop on the court as well, man. I watched a couple of his games here in the G League and, you know, the time when he was in the NBA too, man. It seemed like the game has slowed down for him as well. And he's able to play with the, the pace of the NBA and the G League. Uh, he, he seems like he's catching on really well because it's so much faster than college, man. I mean, I feel like a lot of players that play in the NBA and the G League, you know, can can vouch for me and say the same thing because the pace is so much different. And I feel like he definitely grew to that um, as the season went along. So, you know, I, I feel like, you know, he definitely has even more room to improve. And, and I'm excited to see him continue to develop that. Yeah, I just think it's, it's just a, a great story about just a, a good guy who is – I mean, again, just a perfect situation. He is, he is, you know, warmly opened his arms to all the attention he's getting, and it's it's been great to see. Um, yeah, absolutely. When you go, when you think about your UCF days, which I know aren't that far in the rearview mirror, so I, I'm not asking you to go in the wayback machine. But uh, when you when you think about the things you accomplished at UCF, uh, among everything that you guys, what you did in your career, obviously you went to the NIT Final Four, you were part of the first. NCAA tournament victory in program history, um, and and everything in between, all the big home games you guys had against maybe Cincinnati and, um, and the winning at Memphis, uh, all that. What for you stands out if someone asks you to bring up a game um, or maybe even a moment? What what for you stands out first in your mind when you talk about your UCF career? Oh man, uh, I mean it's it's tough. You know, mm-hmm. it's tough. I've had so many great games at UCF, man, that I can remember just. And I cherish every single one of those games, man, because I learned from every single one of them. Um, I, I, I just, I have to say, man, I think the biggest one that sticks out most for me is, you know, the last one, because that's the last one that I just think of, you know, that Duke game. You know, it just, it, it showed our passion, you know, every single one of our guys on our team. Uh, it showed that, that we could have played with anybody in the country, you know, and, and it showed what UCF, what where our program was heading, you know, heading in the right direction, and you know, and, and even if, even though we lost, man, it just showed that you know we made not only UCF but Orlando proud of what we did, and and I and that's what all I wanted to do when when I first got to UCF is just you know change the mentality and change the program of basketball to a winning mentality, and, and, and that's I feel like for my four years there. With the players that we had, you know, we were able to accomplish that. So uh, I feel like that game just stands out the most, man. That Duke game, it was just, it, it was, it was like a dream. To be honest. I'm so glad you brought that up because I know sometimes it's it's hard to revisit losses and, and players don't like that. I mean, um, you know, I can you, you can ask about any game, but the losses are the ones that players want to talk about. So I'm glad you brought that up because I, I do want to ask you about that. The, just the 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 overall um, what that game meant to the program, even in a loss. I know it obviously hurt immediately. There was the very famous uh, v- video in the locker room where, I mean, honestly, Chad, you're the one who's bawling the hardest. I mean, you're you're extremely emotional in that moment after the game. But but once you know, once that sort of dies down a little bit, and and life continues, and the weeks and months pass, when did your outlook on that game turn from how painful the loss was into taking pride into how much? effort and fight and talent you guys showed on that court against at the time was the best team in the country no absolutely man i mean you know even when you watch that video man you know you just see the emotions you see my emotions but you know when you see those emotions man you just see how how much that you know how much we meant for each other how much we, how much we care for each other how much we want to win you know and, and and it hurts you know in the moment in that time you know it hurts and just all the emotions, all the years at UCF, all the all the mornings we woke up and grinded together, mm-hmm. and, and the losses we had together, and the wins we had together, and just everything just hits you in that moment of, you know, this is our last time playing together. It just, you know, all the emotions just fly everywhere, you know. But I, I want to say, man, that you know, as time moves forward, man, I, I can definitely say that we we accomplished something huge, you know, mm-hmm. even in that loss. You know, it just showed that, hey, man, like UCF was not a team to play around with, you know, and, and I feel like we made UCF and, like I said, the Orlando community proud of what we did. And, 
you know, I just wanted to tell the young guys at that time as well to, you know, just remember, just remember, you know, uh, the, the steps that we had to take to get here and just continue to, to improve and continue to, to make UCF and, and Orlando proud, man. So, you know, I, I feel like in the, in the time, you know, it was tough, but as time moved forward, man, I can definitely say that, you know, I realized that we definitely did something special and we made Orlando and UCF proud for sure. You know, we here at the website, uh, it was blackandgoldbanneret.com. We held, we held at the end, the end of the year awards for UCF athletics. And one of the, one of the awards was game of the year. And this was voted on uh, by the fans. And that is the game of the year, that one game of the year. Even in a loss, that game is – and it's, I, I totally agree with it. Even in a loss, that is better than any football game that happened last year, any other basketball game, baseball, soccer, tennis, whatever. It's the best UCF athletic game I've seen in 2019. And um, it was it was a, a pleasure to be at. And I can't imagine just, again, what it was like to play. And have you watched any clips from that game since? Oh, man. Uh, I, I've watched it one time. Uh, I've watched it one time, man. And, and, and actually, the time that I watched it, um, I was actually, oh, I'm trying to think. Uh, actually, one of my teammates, one of my teammates, actually, when I was in training camp, you know, with the Mavericks, hmm. um, uh, kind of like pulled it up and it was like, hey, man, is, is this you guarding Zion? And I was like, hey, man, I don't want to watch that. You know, I still, I still lose sleep over that game, but. You know, we, we watched it with those guys and stuff like that. And um, I still personally have to watch it just one-on-one. I, it's just, it's hard for me to do, man, because, you know, we, we we put together such a good scouting report for that game. And, you know, just to come down to the wire like that, man, it was just, it was it, it was tough to, to, to not, you know, to not move forward. But, um, you know, I think that was probably the only time I probably watched highlights of that game, man. Yeah, man, it was, it was hard for me because, you know, uh, when I went in the locker room, I think my first day I got there, uh, a couple of veterans like Courtney Lee and mm-hmm. um, Dorian Finney-Smith and a couple of those guys were actually, you know, kind of, you know, welcome me in, you know, first day there and stuff like that. And then, you know, they like, hey, man, so let me see your last game in college. And then they just looked it up and I was like, oh, man, I don't want to watch this, man. This is it gives me sleepless nights a little bit. I would be bad telling coach. I was like, Coach, man, I, I know, I know you haven't watched it. He said, Man, I, I can't, I can't watch it, man. It's tough. It's tough. You know, it's hard. So, yeah, man, that, those are definitely, definitely moments that it's hard to, to look back on. But you know, I, like I said, man, I feel like we definitely. Definitely made our city and our school proud for sure. Yeah, and uh, you've continued to do so with your with uh, how you've played in the pro league and now at the TBT. Uh, obviously, we're we're playing you know we're playing this tournament not only you know amid the coronavirus, but certainly the social discussions of racial inequality and police uh, police brutality that have really permeated this country over the past month. Uh, I, I know you got. I know you just got there in Columbus and really haven't had time to discuss with your teammates. But you know, if you look what the NBA is trying to do with possibly having players wear messages on their jerseys, um, you know, during the during the, during their playing down here in, in Orlando, do you think or would you bring up uh, to your teammates or maybe your coaches about doing some sort of silent demonstration, something to acknowledge the moment and to use the stage that you guys would have on ESPN to sort of you know advocate for what you believe in. Yeah, man. So I was actually thinking about it, um, you know, in, in my room and in the time being in here. I was thinking of ways that we can definitely uh, support, the, you know, the situation. Because, man, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's tough, man. It's tough, in, you know, with the world we live in and, and seeing those situations just go on, you know, it's, it's, it's sad because, you know, me being an African-American and, and having, you know, me, myself and my family members, you know, um, you know, for me, it might be a little different because of the platform I have mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, me playing sports and things like that. But, you know, for like my family members and stuff, man, they don't have the same platform. So it's it's, it's challenging, you know, it's just, and it's scary at the same time because it's like, hey, man, if that happens to a random person on, on, on the, in the community and on the streets, it's like you don't know who it can happen to next. So, you know, I, I've actually thought about, you know, maybe doing something for, you know, the national anthem or, or, you know, putting, you know, Black Lives Matter on, on our shorts or our warmups or, you know, something. And I actually uh, was going to talk to, to Alex about it as well to, you know, see what he has to say about it because, 
you know, it's just, it's, it's a great opportunity to do it, you know, being on national television and to be able to show what, you know, what we all stand for and, and for wanting peace in the world. So I think it's, it's a big opportunity to do it. So I've definitely been having some ideas about it. Yeah, I think it's only natural because not only of the stage you guys would have nationally, but also because basketball among North American sports is certainly the most social, socially conscious uh, of of all the, the major North American sports. So I think it's certainly something that I, I would expect to see. And, um, you know, I, 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 I wish you guys the best in doing what, what you know is right. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. What, what is what is just the general excitement to start here in just about six days as we talk on Tuesday, June 30th? What is the, the feeling? I know you just got there, but uh, as we get closer to July 5th, what's the excitement going to be like to play professional, like play competitive basketball again? Oh, man, I, I'm excited, man. I'm so excited to play, man. I've been I've been training and working hard. and I'm just excited to, to showcase being on national television. Uh, you know, the, the G League, you know, we don't play on national television every night you can still watch us but we don't play on espn so right. to be able to play on espn and to be able to you know showcase my skills and what i've been continuing to work on man I, i'm excited i'm excited i've been putting in a lot of work during you know the, the quarantine and, and, and the virus situation so you know i'm very excited for the moment and i'm able i'm also excited to, to, to go out there and compete, to compete against guys that also want to win as well man so you know it's a big prize on the line so you know we're all fighting for something, you know, so um, it's, it's going to be a great opportunity. How have you tried to prepare or just stay in shape, basketball shape, over these past few months with no basketball going around? What's been your routine? Uh, routine, man, so, you know, I wake up every morning, wake up every morning, run two miles, um, I do it every single day, and then I also have a trainer on Monday, Wednesday, Friday to where I go and, and lift and work with my strength and conditioning trainer. Um, and then for basketball wise, I, I have a high school gym that I work out at back home, and then I also work out in Orlando as well, a uh, gym in Orlando that I go to. So I've been I've been trying to just stay busy, man, and mm-hmm. stay focused, you know, because this time is easy to get distracted, you know, with all the situations and everything going on. But you know, I, I have a lot of good, you know, people and a good, um, a lot of good people in my in my circle that. You know, tell me to continue to stay focused and continue to stay locked in, and, and that's what I've been doing. And you know, I, I definitely believe that I took strong advantage of you know this quarantine um, uh, situation. So I, I'm excited to finally be able to go back out there and showcase what I've been working on and, and what I've been improving on as well. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting how you know once leagues start coming back, like the NBA and maybe college football. You'll get to see how these players have been training or not training during all this downtime. And so it's 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 I, I expect nothing less out of you because you're such a a, a workout freak. But uh, but certainly you've been working hard. Yeah, man. And I mean, and yeah, like you said, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be good to, to to see other guys and you know, this, and especially in this TBT, man, so many good players that's going to be in it. A lot of NBA veterans that played in the NBA and things like that. So um, it's, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be exciting to definitely play against those guys as well. Once uh, the TBT is over, it runs from July 4th to July 14th. Um, do you know, obviously sports are down. I mean, the, the G League is, is, is dormant right now. Do you know uh, what would be next for you athletically? Um, athletically next for me, man, I, 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 I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely uh, – definitely you know, it's possibilities that I could have opportunities, um, especially, you know, with, with the NBA and, and the bubble with guys opting out of not playing and things like that. So I could have opportunities because as a free agent, you're allowed to, uh, the NBA is allowed to assign replacement guys for guys from uh, two-way players all the way to NBA G League players as well. So, um, you know, it could be opportunities there as well. So, you know, I'm just um, I'm, I'm just taking it day by day, man. I'm just mm-hmm. focusing on the the TBT right now, and then whatever opportunity I have next, I you know, just take advantage of it. But uh, for right now, I'm just taking it day by day and just, just focusing on the TBT. Yeah, professionally, are you a free agent? Um, for for me right now, yes, I am a okay. free agent. So I'm I'm able to sign, you know, with with any team hmm. um that. 
that has open spots and roster spots. So, you know, when that time comes and, you know, if an opportunity comes, I definitely take advantage of it. So just taking it day by day right now, man, and just, you know, seeing where the opportunity, you know, stands. Yeah, it's an interesting opportunity because you look at, obviously, some, some guys have decided to sit out, but obviously there's been a lot of coronavirus positive tests that have impacted teams. You look at a team like the – the, the Brooklyn Nets, they've lost a, a lot of, a handful of guys recently for positive tests. So there are, there are spots gonna, that are open. I'm sure there's going to be more spots opening too. So, um, well, we wish you the best there. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely, man. So, you know, just taking it day by day and seeing, you know, talking with my agent and stuff like that and seeing where the possibilities, where the possibility stands and, you know, just, um, like I said, just taking it day by day. So, yeah. you know, we'll see what happens, but just staying in the moment right now. Well, Chad, thanks so much. Best of luck as you get started this weekend in the TBT. You'll be facing uh, the Heard That, the Marshall alumni team, in the first round of the tournament. That's July 5th on t- at 2.30 uh, at, or 2 o'clock on some ESPN network. I'm not even sure which, exactly which ESPN network, but some ESPN network will be carrying that game. Um, and, we, and we wish you the best of luck and stay safe and stay sane in the quarantine bubble. Yeah, absolutely, man. I definitely appreciate it. I appreciate you for uh, calling me and allowing me to, to get on. So I definitely thank you, man. So there's Chad Brown again talking about how tough it was for him to to, to watch clips of the uh, the Duke loss in 2019. But I swear, guys, I, I, you know, for every guy on that team that was there, I keep wanting to bring it up, especially those to, to whom we haven't talked to about, you know, talked to them about the game, you know, because people don't know. But after that game was over – we really didn't get any exit interviews with the players and coaches because, you know, B.J. Taylor and Taco Fall and, and, and Chad, and they had all gone to, like, their separate camps to work out for the draft. Uh, Johnny Dawkins went, was away. Um, so, really, you know, I've, I've talked to Aubrey a little bit about the game. We talked to Taco, uh, I think, a little bit about the game. But that's about it. So, to get anybody who was in that game and get their perspective on it, uh, I think is really necessary. So, I'm glad that Chad was – was willing to talk about it because I am always willing to talk about it. It's still one of the, if it may be the best UCF sporting event I've ever attended. Jeff, it's, it sounds to me, Jeff sounds like Merce working on a book. That's what it sounds like <laughs> to me. It's, it's still, well, I think it's interesting. Like, you know, we throw around the idea of, you know, uh, the idea of passion and how much passion these guys really have. Like you can tell that, all these, you know, well, I say all these years later, it's not only two years, but it's still raw. It still hurts, mm-hmm. you know? And, I mean, you, you can imagine how, obviously, we all, we talk about it, you know, watching it as, as alumni and, and guys who cover the team. And, you know, we hear fans talk about it all the time. But, I mean, for the players and the coaches, like, it's it's still so raw. It's like, they, it, it's like this, it ha- that, that wound has not scabbed over yet. It it probably won't for people like Johnny Dawkins, who has told me out front that he will not watch the game ever again. So, uh, no, uh, it probably will never. But I'm glad that Chad was willing to talk about it and did admit that he has watched parts of it. And I and 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 what I really want to get out of that when I when I bring it up is the acknowledgement that although it hurts so much, that they at least you know understand and over time realize how much that game meant to the program, how proud they made you know fans of the program uh, for their showing that day. And really that although they lost, it was really a win in the minds of so many because of how they played, how they performed, how they matched up against the best team in the country. And really they can look back on that with pride. Yeah. I don't think I, don't, I think that they probably won't even realize how important that was to the program for several years. But, you know, we'll have to see. I know that. Um, yeah, but it was, it was again, it was so good to talk to Chad and and hear from him. And he was always a fan favorite here. And uh, and I think that that's probably you know, he's certainly one of the f- most fun interviews and most fun people to talk to that I think we've heard in quite some time for um, UCF basketball so again you can watch Chad oh go ahead Murph I'm sorry one more thing, one more thing I'll bring up with, with, with uh, here Jeff and I brought up with both players as you heard I, I'm interested to see what kind of um, display or or uh, or, um, or uh, silent protest or anything that they do that this team is going to do in terms of, uh, of Black Lives Matter and reaching out to protest against again the continued protest against uh, systemic and inequ- systemic inequality, racial inequality, police brutality. Uh, I talked to both guys about it. It's it's been something that they've thought about, they've talked about publicly about, and I think that as they get together, and you know, these guys are just they, these guys just showed up in Columbus this week, so they really haven't even met their really haven't even met their teammates and and gone over things yet. 
But I think because of basketball being a socially conscious sport and because of, of, of just the moment, I think you're going to see protests and you're going to see statements. And I'm interested to see what that is going to look like. And it certainly sounds from talking to AJ and Chad, there will be a lot of discussion uh, and a lot of openness about what they should do. Yeah, there's a lot of things. I mean, this is really the first um, it, the, the first go. We're starting to see sports kind of ramp up back here. And this is the first sport that's at least ancillary to the four major sports that's firing back up. So um, it'll be interesting to see how everything unfolds. What cues will we be seeing from the players, the coaches? Um, and by the way, just to recap as well, uh, some other guys on the team who are uh, on Team Jimmy V who you might be familiar with, Marcus Towns, who is a shooting guard for Loyola Chicago when they made it all the way to the Final Four. He's on this team. Josh Perkins, who played for the Hornets, uh, was a point guard for Gonzaga. He's on this team. The, uh, the head coach is Daniel Sokolovsky, who's from Hunter College. Um, he's got a couple of assistants, including Matt Johnston from Rutgers. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, also one of the, the team booster for yeah. uh, the, playing for Jimmy V is Scott Brooks, the former uh, Oklahoma City uh, Thunderhead coach. Also, I guess the roster isn't updated to show it, but that team, that Jimmy, that playing Virginia V team signed or added Hashim to beat. That's true. Yeah, I just saw that. Yeah. So how about yes. that? Some size up front. You got 7'3", Hashim Thabit, and 6'10", Chad Brown. Not too bad, right? Going to be like playing with Taco, kind of. I mean, so I didn't ask him, but I would imagine it's kind of like that. All right. Well, I, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Also, another guy uh, who uh, maybe some players might be familiar with, William Coleman, who played for Memphis, is uh, also uh, on the team. So um, so we have uh, – so that's the, that's the look. Once again – uh, the basketball tournament begins on the 4th of July at 3 p.m. Uh, on ESPN. Uh, but Team Jimmy V with A.J. Davis and Chad Brown take on Heard That on Sunday, July the 5th at 2 p.m. That's the first of four games on that day. It's the round of 24, 32 teams, single elimination tournament, top eight get buys. Uh, and uh, they playing it. And this Jimmy V team is playing Heard That, which is a team of Marshall uh, alumni. Uh, they, By the way, Jimmy V is the 10 seed uh, in the tournament. If they win, uh, they would go on as the winners of game five to play a team called the Money Team. And You want to uh, guess who's uh, got a portion of that team? The... Uh, Who's the on the portion? Who's on a portion oh. of that team? Or no, so who's like basically subsidizing that team? Oh, Floyd Mayweather. Uh, oh, Flo oh, that's right. Okay, Floyd. That's the Floyd Mayweather's team. That's right. All right. Thank well you for being aware. Well what done. The money team for. Yes, Bryce Alford, by the way, is on that team. There, there are former NBA players. I mean, Tony Roten is in this is in this tournament. Uh, it's an interesting cl a collection of like, oh yeah, I remember that guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, remember that guy. It's uh, the Marshall team, by the way. Uh, any familiar names that we know on them? Uh, I well, probably not nationally, no. But uh, I know that uh, as I look at the roster, they had they had, they they have a, a three point specialist. Oh God, I can't. I gotta pull it up. Um, that who was set like he set like records in Marshall. It was John? I think it was John Elmore. John Elmore. Yo, I remember Marcus Reed play uh, when he played for them as well. Uh, and obviously there's there's a bunch of guys who did not go to Marshall but actually uh, played uh, in the same conference as Marshall. Like for example, Ja'Cory Williams played at Middle Tennessee. Um, you know, there's a couple of other guys who are, are kind of, I guess you could say Marshall adjacent. Uh, for, for you know Chris uh, Chris Coakley, who played at UAB. So um, so yeah, I mean it's. You know, it's it's not it's not like there's going to be a lot of scouting reports out there, obviously, but that's at least what we're looking forward to. Again, it's going to be uh, July the 5th uh, on uh, on ESPN. Go ahead, Murph. I'm sorry. Well, it's going to be it's going to be professional it's going to be, you know, professional level basketball. Yeah, yep. it's not going to be like NBA quality. It's kind of like watching the KBO, right? It's like it's baseball. It's not major league baseball quality, but um, it, but it, you know, it's at least it's something to watch. And this one, th this won't be on at five thirty in the morning. Well, I, I I've watched some of these games before because I also follow the the uh, the Syracuse alumni team, Bayheim's Army. They've been in the mm -hmm. in the tournament the last three years, and these games do get competitive. Let me tell you, 
And because, uh, yeah. uh, you know, these guys, the, I mean, I, I know this sounds kind of bizarre, but like the million dollars is worth a ton to these guys. Because again, they're they're not they're not in the NBA. They're not in the G League. Some of these guys are kind of moonlighting, doing you know, doing like regular dude jobs, you know, in this case. But they take the they take the summer to play in this tournament, and uh, you know, at least they're doing this for a good cause for the Jimmy V Foundation as well. Uh, t- playing for Jimmy V is, and uh, again, we'll get to see them 2 p.m. July 5th, their first round game against uh, Heard That on ESPN. All right, we get back. Listener questions. Hopefully some answers and a grab bag of news from the week uh, in UCF sports. Stick around. We'll be right back. All righty. Welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez, and Brian Murphy with you. Time for some listener questions. Finally, somebody bothered to write us. We had like two listener two listeners sent in questions. I'm really disappointed in you, UCF Twitter. Come on now. You guys can do better than this. Are you are you that you know? Are, are, are it, I know that they're still plugged in. All right, I want it, special thanks go out to a couple people. All right, first of all, Paul Bouvier, whose uh, he, whose uh, handle is not fake Bouvier, sent us two questions, uh, and then we also got Lovejoy Vapor, which I don't think that's his real name, but we got some questions from him as well. Uh, uh, all right, let's start with Paul's two questions. Let's go. Uh, let's start this one. I, I've been looking forward to this one uh, regarding COVID nineteen. I know everyone is pushing, hoping for a football season, but are we going to be able to morally support a continued season if or when the first kid ends up in the ICU or even worse, dies? I get the feeling not many are considering that reality. Um, my first answer is no. And I think that's the thing that uh, uh, a lot of uh, that a lot of these administrators are 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 considering right now. And uh, Murph, you brought to our attention tonight that uh, what is it a week from today the ivy league is going to decide whether or not they're going to go ahead with a fall sports season and how how easily enough we for, we forget they were the first ones to pull the plug on their conference tournament when covid-19 started spiraling out of control yeah and, so it's well, yeah. they're going to they're going to make a decision by July 8th so I, I assume they could make it before July 8th but they'll make a decision by July 8th about whether or not to hold fall sports as scheduled or, or really whether they will push fall sports into the spring you'll remember back i think it was on march 10th was a tuesday that was the day that they canceled their conference tournaments in basketball and basically canceled their their spring sports not uh, like maybe the same day and i remember talking with uh, johnny dawkins uh later that afternoon after the, the word came out that the ivy league had canceled their conference basketball tournaments and he was just sort of like you know couldn't believe it just beside himself like oh my god that's awful for the players i mean that's just really surprising and then 24 hours later everything stopped and here we are right all right but i think the 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 other thing is they were the first ones to go they kind of set the tone and they might set the tone here um as well but i want to go back to the question i I mean the obvious answer is no i don't think anyone can morally support that right i i will point out that UCF dealt with this where they had a you know who was on ICU worrying about whether he'll have a leg or not so let's I, I will point out that football of all sports has a lot of risks I'm not saying that obviously that is a factor but uh, I would not judge it based on if a player ends up on ICU because players have ended up on ICU playing football for various reasons, injuries that they could you know end their careers or even worse we've had football players uh, unfortunately, die in practice uh, in various forms. So, you know, football, I mean, it, it's it's the one sport that there's a ton of risk to begin with, uh, not just adding this value to yeah, it. Yeah, but this so is a point. different, this is a different risk. This is sure. clearly a different risk. And, you know, if, so, and, and we're starting to see numbers pop in here and there about, um, you know, from different schools about how many players test positive, but we don't know what happens. And obviously, they're trying to protect the athletes as much as they can. But if word gets out that you know that someone's on a ventilator, I mean, that's that's not good. That, that's going to make us feel uh, that. I personally look at that. I'm like, uh, uh-uh. uh, no. Well, I, but I, I let me can't. ask. So did you? So did you feel bad when Mackenzie Milton was in a hospital? And, of course. You know, okay. <laughs> I mean, but they played. They were going to play anyway. 
So I, I agree with you. I well, don't like think injuries kick- like that do, I mean, they have to make yeah. you always think, I'm not saying like cancel football, but I'm saying, I'm saying, you know, an injury like that always like resets your perspective. Yeah, I'm just, that's bit, my right? point. I, I don't. I don't think football is the sport for to talk about morality. It's not that it, 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 there, there's a lot of things in football that I think would kind of like, wow, do we really need to be doing that? And then, well, yeah, well, everybody likes it. So now I don't think it's going to get to that point uh, at all not. because, well, <laughs> I mean, I'm not like I said. I don't think we're going to have a start of a season, uh, and I think I have a feeling whatever the Ivy League does, a lot of people will start to follow, but. Um, I'm not going to use that as the reason. Oh, well, this is why we're shutting down all of a sudden or they can't continue. Trust me, these players have dealt with serious things on the field as well. So it's not like, oh, my God, this is like so weird that a player went on ICU. They've done it before. I'm not justifying it, but they're to football is the kind of where, yeah, you're going to have players that go on ICU for various reasons. Mm. Well, I mean, this is the thing that, at coaches and administrators have to deal with, and we're going to be yep. dealing with that in the next. By the uh, way, wait, here's, and here's the problem: is it would be we're probably not going to know if a player is there or not based on if these schools are going to be very open with who's tested positive or not. Are they going to come out and say, "Yeah, guys, yeah, we we got three or four players that are in ICU"? That hasn't happened yet. Now yeah. that might be good news because most of them have been okay, as far as we know. But you know. How are we going to know? Will the schools be as open to that? Who knows? Well, we talked about this last week about how yeah. UCF is no longer making it public that student athletes are testing positive. And uh, I understand the, the 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 worry with that and the concern. I also understand the other side of it of of even if you think it's even if you think it's uh, just a, just a reason to shield yourself, there is some student athlete concern here and and health and health privacy here that you want to also be aware of jeff before i answer the question do you want to address the listeners who are no doubt screaming at you about uh how people of a college football playing age don't usually get sick or go to the hospital or die from this and are probably upset of you at even inferring that uh yeah they can shut the f up okay so now that that's aside uh i I think (laughs) i think all right that like again it, I, I, we cannot we, we we cannot make an apples to apples argument with about mckenzie milton and uh, uh, uh almost losing a leg and a, a player pers- prospectively if if this was to happen as the as the questioner asked uh being put on a ventilator or fighting for his life uh, mckenzie milton's like range of outcomes were drastically limited within hours of the injury he was basically stabilized we, we, we knew basically within 24 hours that his leg was basically saved. So, yes, things went forward. Well, it worked out. We're, we were fortunate it worked out. Thankfully, right. he was near a hotel, a, a hospital there. And I'm not saying that's the same thing. What I'm saying is football has dealt with athletes being in an extreme situation. I'm not saying to condone it. I'm just saying that this is not a first when we're talking about football and dealing with serious health situations, whether it be you know physical or in this case, obviously with the health with the virus. My, my thing is, I'm I'm saying that if things had turned out more dire for McKenzie, if it was like right. a worst case scenario, things actually might have been different for UCF. I, I think there would have been more discussion about whether or not they go forward with that Memphis game. Um, really? I really do. Okay. Yes. Hmm. Ooh. Now. Okay. Now, uh, and people were like, that's ridiculous. Like, no, you talk about your star player losing his freaking leg. Uh, There is also this distinction, as heartless as it may seem, that that was still a football injury while uh, while contracting the coronavirus, while maybe done on the field of play is not a football injury. Uh, And so that is a different sort of thing. I think football teams also, as we've seen the releases of, you know, so many players on this team uh, have caught it or so many players on this team have the antibodies. They have almost baked in now that they the the reality that players will test positive, and there is a threshold to how many players can we sustain testing positive before we have to make a decision. Because I I, I believe it's a there's a there's a non-zero number there where coaches will, for the lack of a better term, forgive me, will be okay or move forward with if guys have the virus, but. If it gets so severe to where someone has the virus, to where their life is actually at stake, then I think that does 
put a different wrinkle into things where we didn't need to examine what we're doing here. We can examine well, this regardless every day. What are we doing here? We're talking about football, but that's like a more of a that's more of a, a broader issue. But on this, uh, if a guy actually ends up in the hospital, then yes, I, I do think we need to examine what's happening here. I mean, uh, one guy ending up in the hospital because uh, he tore his ACL or dislocated his kneecap is different. One guy fighting for his life uh, and and you know over an extended period of time I, I, because of a virus that's plaguing the entire globe, I think is obviously something completely different than that. And yeah. I think that'll, as we come to it, we'll we'll see how coaches react. But I do think if it gets that severe, there will need to be some conversations about whether or not we can go on. Well, and I don't think, but I think we're focusing on the wrong people. I, I'm not I, the players is not the one where that scenario I think could play out where people would cause a pause. I think the li- the higher likelihood is if a coach on staff yeah. gets it. I think that's to me, I don't understand. I mean, to me, that has been an underplayed story in all of this. We're so you're focused. Not, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right. We're, ju- we're, I think we're addressing the question, but that is absolutely correct. Uh, you know, unless, you know, certainly these coaches are more at risk, especially if you're in your fifties and sixties or, or, or you know, of that age, uh, or if pre, you know, pre-existing conditions, underlying conditions that we don't know about, right. that puts so much more of a risk. And um, there's so many more. There's so much more to this we could talk about. Like it's not just about the players; it's about the people that are around, their family members, uh, and, and everyone else they come in contact with. So if they're if, they, if they're infected, it's not just about one person; it's about everybody inside their their tight community that they that they're around. Mm. Um, so there's so many there's so many things to discuss here. Well, I guess we'll get. I guess we should just tackle the question uh, uh, that, that, well, I know that this, this, this person who asked this question have another question. Yeah, that, we're gonna get- yeah the one more. This this one was a little bit more complicated, so so bear with me here. All right. Okay. Uh, again, this is, again, this was from Paul Bouvier, not fake Bouvier on Twitter. Uh, yeah. What do you all think is the downside to a medical red shirt for Mackenzie Milton? Assuming no COVID-19, or maybe also consider it, uh, my opinion, this is this is Paul Bouvier's opinion, is that is that's a likely avenue for McKenzie, but there could be some negative second and third order effects, such as losing a good recruit or two, like Mike Wright, because of a stacked quarterback room. Assuming Milton is the starter, you'd have Dylan Gabriel redshirting his junior year, and potentially QB1 is all but locked for four more years. Worst case, DG plays through his uh, redshirt senior year in this scenario. So... Going back to the original point, if you're Mackenzie Milton, would you take a red shirt this year? It's it, that is it, that will only be decided by him and his doctors. That's it. Uh, That's supposed to be, that it, decision it, is supposed to be coming fairly soon, I think, right? It's supposed to be well. We're supposed to get some news in I, on it. I should it's, say it's it's it's, it, it, it's a moving timetable at this point, but it, there there should be something we hear probably in this month. Um, but I don't think Mackenzie Milton will be open to taking a red shirt if he is given medical clearance. Uh, as amazing as that would be, like, let, let's 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 quickly let me just say, if he is cleared for full contact football, that is going to be one of the biggest stories in college football. Full stop. Full stop. And I don't think he would be content with taking a red shirt. Uh, if he's able to do that. And I, I, I think certainly UCF would like to get him into games. Um, so, no, I, 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 again, it's, it's, it's difficult. I understand the, the argument of they would lose a recruit, and I, I worry about guys like Parker, Navar- Parker Navarro, um, the freshman who's just coming in now. Like, where does he fit in all this when you've got Milton, but also you've got three more years of, of Dylan Gabriel and, and then apparently maybe two more years of, of Daryl Mack. Where does Parker Navarro fit? So, yeah, there could be some guys who – who move out of the program, uh, uh, but I, I think there's no. I, I wouldn't worry that if if Milton isn't on. If, if Milton doesn't take a red shirt, I'm not. My first thing is I'm not worried about what that means for the quarterback room because I can still see ways in which they utilize all three. Certainly, they can utilize two of them regardless because Daryl Mack has his own skill set that those guys can't really do. Uh, can't Daryl Mack is kind of like a Cam Newton disciple where he's this big kid. They can use around the goal line with with really good efficiency, whereas obviously Milton and Gabriel are smaller. I think there's a role there for DJ. Um, as far as how they split the reps, uh, if there is splitting of reps between Dylan Gabriel and Mackenzie Milton, 
I don't know. However, if that's a possibility, just talk to yourself about how crazy that is that McKenzie Milton <laughs> is able to play football again. I know. And that's 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 the thing. I mean, wouldn't I, we've said it before? If it, you know, it, if and when McKenzie Milton steps onto a football field in a working capacity, once again, to me, that's the greatest story in college football of the year. Uh, it it just is now. If we have a so, if we have a, if we have a season, uh, and, and, and 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 let me bring that up because I think that uh, I want to timing is going to be everything on this. Uh, now clarify the question: Is he going to? Is the question based on an, under an assumption that we have a season? Assuming we, we have a season, because I think there's multiple layers to this. Let's say there is a season, but the season's delayed to late fall or spring. Let's say the season spring. Well, that buys Mackenzie Milton more time. So uh, it actually would benefit him if the season is delayed. So I think it, it really depends on what happens here. The other aspect is, let's say there is no season whatsoever. Now there's a whole issue about, are all these players going to get an automatic Red shirt? Yeah, are they going to do? Are they going to do what they did with baseball and softball? Well, and the right? problem is though that's a much more expensive sport to do that. It's one thing to give a red shirt to twenty scholarships or so. It's another to give what eighty five. I just don't. That's a that's a lot to ask, and that could impact the decision whether McKenzie would even be able to get a red shirt or a medical red shirt or not based on what the situation is. And he may not want to even regardless. Uh, he Because at some point, people want to move on um, as far as that's concerned. So I, I kind of agree with Brian. It's not something I worry about. Quarterbacks are going to move on regardless because in today's day and age, if a kid's not playing anymore, they got, you know, the dad or the – they're, oh, we got to move on to the next spot to play. So I, honestly, I, I think it's – I, to worry about if a third quarterback or a fourth quarterback is going to stick around, I think is a is a waste of time because there's going to be movement in that position regardless of what happens with Mackenzie Milton or beyond. Similar to that question that you were answering there, Eric. Uh, question Eric, from Eric's question is right up your alley. I yeah. can't wait for Eric to go first on this one. Uh, Lovejoy Vapor asks, "What will attending UCF football look like?" And then he lists a, a, like a bunch of bullets here, but he says, "Bullet one is no season." Number two, season with no fans in attendance and TV only. Number three, season with mandatory face masks and fans in the stands with tailgating. Number four, season with mandatory face masks and fans in the stands and zero tailgating. Option number five, wide open, just like normal. Um, I'm not really sure what the question is, but I think... Well, you can eliminate number five. Okay. Uh, won't be, it won't be like normal. The, um, no, he's, ask, he's asking, what do, you think, what do you think the season will look like? Uh, out of those options? Yes. All right, I guess I'll go first. I think we're going to have a season with no fans and TV only. When? Um, see, this is where it gets interesting. because And is it, and it, and is it universal? Because I'll, See, I'll, that's, I'll... that's the thing. I, I really think we have not settled the question yet of what the season is really going to look like. Let's say the... The virus spike that we are seeing in the South and the West continues, and I hope it doesn't. But let's say let's say it does. Um, there's a distinct possibility that we might see the quote autonomous five end quote conferences say, you know what, we're not going to play in the month of September. We're going to have a conference only season in the Big Ten and the Big 12, and the SEC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as we've talked about before, the other five conferences in the in FBS really need their out-of-conference schedules because there's buy games that, they, that, they, that help feed the coffers, right? So I could very much see a schism resulting from this where if the Power Five conferences say, you know what, we're gonna we're going to play conference, we're gonna play conference only. The NCAA comes in and says, no, 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 you must do this. Follow these regulations. All these schools are big state schools in various different states that have various different forms of regulation regarding COVID nineteen, and it just becomes a total cluster. And I would not be surprised if this is the final death blow to the NCAA's. Um, 
venture in college football and those conferences decide to bug out. they're involved in college out. football to begin with. They're not. So, I mean, well, that's they a, are. Okay, yeah. Uh, they don't – last I checked, the conferences have always run football. That's why we have the system that is in place – and we don't have a 16-team playoff or whatever. So that the whole NCAA thing is irrelevant. I think the bigger issue is here, what do they get in here? And I think I could see a scenario where some conferences play. I do agree with you if I had to predict, and it's so hard because, and Brian has mentioned this for months now, for months, things change. We just, there's so much unknown and uncertainty, right? Like a month ago, everybody was feeling pretty good about things. Now, not so much. Um, I just think to me, and I've told this to people, I think we're headed for a conference season only. And the reason is, for example, I think the way this breaks down, I don't think we're going to start on time. And Brian, you mentioned this a couple episodes ago, and I want you to kind of expand on this because you did a good job of explaining this about the rules. And I don't think it's been really brought up enough about how a certain teams have to fill uh, the requirements that you have to fill out a certain amount of practices and you cannot have an interruption if you want to start on time. Uh, can Do you know what I'm talking about? Remember when you kind of broke down the NCAA kind of guidelines as far as their the dates and the, the amount of practices they could have between then and the start of the season? Right. So this was going this is this is about preseason practices. And so you see and well every team has a number of preseason they have a schedule of preseason workouts and then the workouts lead to practices. But every team needs to get in, I, I believe, and I'm looking up the date, I believe it's 24 uh, practices before you can start a season. Uh, and, if you, if, and if you don't get, you, you have to have, uh, I think it's 24. Um, so without that, without that, without those number of days for like full contract, like full contact training camp type practices, you can't start. That They are required to have uh, 24 days uh, of, uh, of, of activity. Uh, basically training camp. So that that is that is something that could certainly be a fly in the ointment uh, because if something happens during camp and days are missed, well, then what do we do now? Yeah. Right. And we're starting to see a little bit of that in Arizona right now where they have spiked big time and the school is kind of, well, we got to hold on on things here. And I just feel like we're going to have some of this interruption and I think we're going to see – I just would be shocked if we get 12 games in. I think we're looking at – a seven, a conference season only, seven to eight games at some point between September and the spring. I do think that spring is going to pick up conversation, especially if if the Ivy League announces between now and July 8th that they're going to move into the spring. You watch. If the Ivy League announces we're moving their football to the spring, that conversation will pick up immensely at that point. And uh, I, I think that's to me, uh, what I think is going to happen. And I would not even be surprised that the national championship will be decided the old fashioned way by the polls, not Hmm. the bowl games. That's my prediction. Yeah. We could probably see the same thing with conference championships too. We would just see, we would just see, uh, tiebreakers and, and no conference championship games too. That's another possibility. So yeah, I'm watching the Ivy league and the other, the other league I'm watching is the big 10. Because I feel like the, the Big Ten's, uh, the, the, obviously, northern schools, um, and they they still kind of have that sort of Ivy League approach to things. Um, and I, I, they're the ones that I'm going to be watching very carefully to see what they All right. We got some news bits. that would, Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Murph. I just wanted to create, so correct something I said just a second ago. So teams are required to complete at least 29 a 29 day preseason, basically training That's camp. That's the one. Yep. If they, they, they they're required to at least complete a 29 day preseason before playing games. If they can't get that many days in, then they cannot play games, and thus we have we have issues. But I just want it's not 24; it's 29 days. No, and that's a big number. That's that's why I just I feel like there's going to be some hiccups here. You can't expect everything to go smoothly, especially. Let's be honest. Let's be fair to some of these schools and even sports teams. They're trying to figure this out on the fly like everybody else. There's not a (laughs) there's not like a, you know, a a book, uh, you know, in a shelf that says, hey, here's what you do in a year of a pandemic, how you play a football season. It's not. So I think we have to understand. I think it's kind of a trial by error. Uh, Hopefully, you know, and one of the things that I think it's hurt 
you know, I think a lot of the sports leagues thought at this time that there would be more sports going on than there actually has been. And I think they were hoping, uh, no offense, Murph, but I think a lot of people were kind of thinking that baseball would be going on by now and they would be taking notes from them. Yeah. Because I kind of feel like, I feel like the sports leagues were kind of like, hey, we're all come back, but you're going to come back first, right? And then, wait, they didn't come back first. No, well, we're not here first. And now, so really we haven't learned anything as far as a team sport. The only sports that have returned is golf, uh, NASCAR, individual sports. Uh, in America. Tennis. In, America. in the United States, correct. Obviously, the rest of the world, because they're smarter, have moved, you know, they're doing things the right way, and they, you know, props to them, and they deserve it, uh, you know, because we stink. But, um, you know, we're like the Yankees in the 80s that don't know what we're doing. But um, nonetheless. It's a good analogy. That's a solid analogy. I'll, I'll allow it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so, but I think that's the problem here in the States. As far as a team sport, we don't know because the NWSL just returned this weekend and as we record this on Wednesday night the MLS is supposed to come back next Wednesday in Orlando they've got a story developing with FC Dallas which is apparently now up to 12 positive cases within FC Dallas so uh, it, it, everybody's kind of doing this on the fly on trial by air and they're trying their best and and I think that's my concern I want to point out too about the universities at UCF I could tell you for a fact uh, they test these students very in depth. Like they know all their medical history. I know of a fact when UCF has had an athlete, for example, in a particular sport that was a highly recruit uh, in an Olympic sport, and they were not cleared by the medical staff because they had a medical, they had a hidden, they had a condition they found. So they were never cleared to play at UCF. That's how strict UCF has been on that. Uh, so they do a pretty good job of that. That kid went on to some other school and is playing and is thankfully is doing well. But I just wanted to point out, because I think some people just think that schools don't take the student athletes health seriously. They do. So I, I think that's important. You may not agree whether they should be playing or what they should be doing or not, but it's not because the medical staffs in these universities are not try are not doing their best because they have their student athletes interest in their best interest. And they've proven that prior to even this pandemic yeah i think that's true and um you know the training staff for ucf they know that their reputation is on the line too um so again boy we're, we're still we're still feeling around in the dark here it's it's a what a time at, to be alive <laughs> at this point i think the safest the safest scenario to really sort of rely on is a no fall season um, because it just it's it just it's hard to see how they pull this off with everything that's going on right, right now. Like in the, in the climate that we're in with the, with the virus, I, I, it's, it, it absolutely would take some ridiculous mental gymnastics to believe that playing football, contact football, is safe. Um, so uh, so I think that the, the the safest bet right now is to say no 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 football. But that's that's you know we're talking well, on July first. Let's be on it. Well, the bigger question that with the spikes will be, will there even be students on campus? I mean, let's not – I mean, the, part of the issue here is the age average at most of these cases is college level. That's that's kind of a big problem here. Most of the new cases, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's a problem here. It's not like, oh, well, you could just avoid certain people. No, 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 no. These are the young kids, and these athletes are going to be in theory – in class with these students who are going out and well, not... there, have been, there have been conversations about theory. maybe maybe having athletes do uh, online right. online uh, instruction uh, to keep them out of classrooms. Uh, however, yes, let's say there's schools that don't bring students back but want to push forward with the football season. That has some bad optics tied to it uh, that would need to be addressed then too. Also, Jeffrey, with your with to your prediction of of no fans but TV and they play play games. Look, I know Danny White does not have the last word in 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 this, but he has come out very strongly against that exact scenario. And that if it came down to that, that they they would play with no fans, he would not want to do that. No, but that's why to Jeff's point, and I, I kind of feel the same way. It wouldn't shock me. That's why I keep going back to this being a conference season only. I could see a scenario where the American hypothetically decides hey we rather wait till the spring and see if we could bring in fans at that point whereas other conferences are like no we're going right now 
So mm-hmm. that's that's the thing. Unfortunately, unlike the pro sports, there's not one direction for everybody. Everybody's kind of run differently. It depends on where you're at. It depends on your situation. It's different for everybody, and that's what makes the college situation the most complicated. I also want to say this because we haven't touched on this. I don't believe that you're going to see certain sports play and certain don't. In other words, if football's not being played, I don't see any fall sports being played either. I, I, do you guys agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay. So I, I think – and I, I would not be surprised if some of the fall sports gets delayed until they know for sure when football will be played. So, unfortunately, I, I, I think college has got a lot of issues in that regard. And Brian brought up the fact if some of these campuses – are only going to have classes on remote that's going to create a whole debate in itself on what is in, in you know what's on campus what is not you know can you do a bubble on in, in you know, can you hide these student athletes probably not i mean you can't i mean the and the problem is you could do every protocol you can but if they're 18 to 22 year olds they if they go out what do you there's nothing you can do mm-hmm. yeah yeah, it's 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 gonna be really hard it, to tell. It, it, it comes it comes down to them being responsible. You know, I mean, that's yeah, a, that's what it comes down and, to. And that's hard. And that's a hard age to depend on that. That's a yeah, very yeah. difficult age, eighteen to twenty-two. Listen, I was the same way. I wasn't responsible. I'm glad I'm not that age right now. But that's a problem. Whereas the pro athletes, they're business people. They, I think, are more willing to do what they got to do. But the college athlete, not so much. Well, you know that. Yeah, we can talk a lot about like physical physiology you know brain physiology and why that is why that is but it's true and how you know teams if any program thinks they can uh sort of instruct their their teenagers and early 20 players to to play a game and then come back to your dorm room and just stay there and don't go anywhere that that's probably not going to happen it's just this is not and like i you know it's it's not it's i understand that we want it we we, you know we vilify we i don't want to vilify those kids because i understand like it's about them being responsible but uh, at that age, you know, you do you do improvisational things, and so let's let's give them a that's little. A, slap that's there. a that's a euphemism if I've ever heard it. Improvisational. <laughs> uh, no, I really no. It's it's definitely true because again, we're talking about I, I'm talking about like brain physiology and how like pre, prefrontal prefrontal cortex stuff that's not fully developed yet that leads to decision making processes. Um, so anyway, also, uh, like I said, Eric, with with no football. They, I, I don't even know how financially you would move forward with other sports, just because football drives everything else. So without right. that, how do you put the, how do you, how do you have the finances to run everything else? I agree. I agree. I think the question at that point becomes: Does soccer, volleyball, cross country, who would be the fall sports, would they be able to play a season in the spring as well, or are they going to have to take a red shirt? I don't know the answer to that. There, I'm sure they're discussing that. But you're right. That's a valid point. Now, that's not including the schools that don't have football, like the basketball schools, uh, like a Wichita State. Uh, that's going to be an interesting situation there as well, because I would – and Michael Donald brought this up in the Orlando radio station on the Beat of Sports. He's on weekly with Mark Daniels, and he brought up the fact he wouldn't be surprised if college basketball got pushed back to January and February, and they just do without the non-conference as well. So. Yeah. You know, it's not like college basketball is off the hook in this either. Yeah, uh, that's going to be. Oh, boy, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad we. I'm glad. You know, the people who make these decisions. There's a reason why they get paid a lot of money. <laughs> that's, and we're and there's a reason why we're not them. Um, there there was some. Uh, speaking of lots of money, there was some news that uh, actually broke down today that I just want to touch upon with you guys real quick before we go. Uh, today, like you mentioned, is uh, well. We're recording this on Wednesday, July first, which is the the uh, which is the date that the calendar flips over for the American Athletic Conference, and uh, a couple of events happening. Number one, that is it for UConn. Farewell, UConn Huskies. They are now officially out of the American Athletic Conference and in the Big East. The American put up a nice little tweet for them uh, yesterday, uh, thanking them, UConn, saying. Uh, uh, we are proud to have had the Yukon Huskies as a founding member of the American. We wish the Huskies well and look forward to a bright future. Thank you, Yukon. The, the replies <laughs> pretty much speak for themselves to that. Um, question for you guys. It's non-football, non-football related, because, because of course, UCF will be playing Yukon in non-conference action in a couple years. Um, 
favorite UCF UConn moment uh, from uh, their time in the American, non football related? God. <laughs> I'll take that as a I'll take that as a pass, Murph. Uh, Eric, you got one. All right. So wait, wait. So it's the favorite. What's your non- favorite non-football related UCF UConn moment? Um. Wow. Well, I know me and Murph enjoyed covering Kevin Ollie's last uh, days as UConn head basketball coach at Orlando at the Amway Center. For the conference tournament that was fun wasn't it Murph? <laughs> we did there was a lot of rumors flying around with kevin ollie and, and yeah. Uh, yeah yeah it's true uh, it's true that happened that was a thing so that was fun was um i actually will miss the gino oriema press conferences murph and i had covered the last co- a couple of those i enjoyed it personally i will miss that uh, aspect of uconn uh, not that necessarily i'll miss uconn women's basketball being in the league just missing gino in general don't you think murph no, he was a great. He was a. He was a. He's like John Calipari in that, like, he knows he has carte blanche to say whatever he wants. Sometimes he says some stuff that's like makes your eyebrows like arc. But uh, but no, it's always fun to listen to, to Gino. I'll say my favorite one was uh, when UCF beat UConn as a conference opponent for the first time, which was January thirty first, twenty eighteen. Seventy sixty one win. That was a that was a big win for UCF at the time, and uh, um. Uh, at 20 points from B.J. Taylor that night, that was a, that was a good night. That was a very I want to bring up. I think it was 2018. God, I, I hope I. Uh, no, it must have been. Oh God, I can't remember if it was 20. I don't know if it was 2018 or 2017. Uh, this isn't even a good moment. It's just something that sticks out in my mind. UCF and UConn played a baseball series up at UConn, uh, which you know it, it was like in March too. Like they shouldn't have played it. It was 20 degrees. Yep. Uh, 2018. That was 2018. Yep. Yeah. I think Joe Sheridan had like seven walks because he couldn't grip the baseball because it was so cold. Uh, And I remember (laughs) talking (laughs) with some of the guys off the record and and talking to them about how much of a complete cluster that series was. Um, Yeah. I think that's my my most outstanding non-football UConn UCF. Reference. They they botched up the softball series too that same weekend, didn't they, Eric? Well, no, I know what you're thinking about. It's a good point. It's a good point because I flew with the team. This was 2016, is what you're thinking about, where they got snowed out. It's the first time I've ever seen snow right. in person. So that is actually probably my favorite you come home because I got to see snow because we were snowed out. I never thought I would say those words, <laughs> but we got snowed out. We what we played. We got one game in. It was about 35 degrees. I was in a it's very kind to call it a press box. It was anything but a press box. It looked more like a, you know, one of those backyard, uh, you know, what do you go you know, when you put all your tools outside in the it's backyard? It's like a shed, a shed. Yeah. shed. That's really what I was in. I was, I could not, I could, I was obstructed from seeing right field. It's one of those where you got to look at, you know, you have to turn your neck a certain way. This is at their old stadium. They have a built, they've built a new one now, apparently. But uh, yes. And then we, it was a little flurry of snow. Uh, Renee, Gillespie had her 600th career win. Shelby Turnier had her 70th career win at that point, I believe. And then we got washed out Saturday and Sunday. We got snowed. I remember we played snow outside the hotel. Uh, <laughs> we ate ice cream. They have great ice cream at Dairy Queen. Uh, there was a, an ice cream place. In Dairy Park. Queen? I don't know if it was Dairy Queen. I forget what it was called. They, but it was very good ice cream uh, in Connecticut. And we had good bowling. And we had fun, and we had fun at Dave & Buster's because we were watching the snow. Dairy Queen. Oh, Cost us, by the way, a chance at a three-peat for the American Conference. That's title true. Because we lost by percentage points to South Florida yeah. that year. Thanks. Yeah. Also, I want to, again, I want to rehash something I just said about the UConn UCF Baseball Series. So on, on two, it was 2018. The Friday night game was uh, was UCF. Was, uh, actually, it was Saturday midday because Friday night got snowed out. Of course it did. So Saturday, Joe Sheridan starts against Mason Fioli, who I think was the conference pitcher of the year. He was, yeah. That game had, tw- that game had 21 walks and eight errors because it was in the 30s, and no one could field the baseball. Everything was hard, and it was bouncing well. And it, that stadium up in, up in Connecticut is not really a baseball stadium to begin with. Uh, it was complete. <laughs> uh, should not have been played. And uh, that's what I remember most about UConn UCF away from the football field is that baseball series being a complete embarrassment. The Dairy Bar. That's what it was called. 
the dairy bar. That's dairy what we bar. Ate our okay. Fantastic okay. ice cream. I thought you were for a second there. You were raving about Dairy Queen. I'm like, really? No, no, no. It's Dairy Bar. It's in stores, Connecticut. Uh, the team knew about it because they celebrated their 2014 conference championship in that place after they won a doubleheader in 2014. So uh, that was some good ice cream. So if for whatever reason you're unfortunately you're back in stores, Connecticut for some reason, go to Dairy Bar. All right. Uh, last now, one other little bit of news, also uh, Jill, uh, <laughs> stemming from this July the first, the uh, new ESPN contract uh, officially uh, takes effect, and also uh, the American has officially moved its conference headquarters uh, from Providence to uh, Irving, Texas, outside of uh, outside of Dallas. Uh, interestingly enough. Uh, gentlemen, the uh, building that the American uh, is now calling home uh, is uh, I, I had it here for a second. I, what was it? What's the name of this? John, it's like John jo- Campbell. Uh, no, 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 no. It's the uh, it's in it's in Irving, Texas. Oh, the it's the uh, Las Colinas um, in. Uh, Golly. Now I'm pulling up the release here. Okay. <laughs> you got any more tales you can regale us with, Eric, while we uh, while we do more? I do. While, while, Je- while Jeff looks, let's talk about your favorite sport, Murph. We brought it. Baseball. Oh, no. <laughs> I, oh, wait. I found it. 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 Okay. So uh, they moved their, uh, their offices to a place called the Summit at Las Colinas in Irving, Texas, um, about 15 minutes outside of Dallas. Interestingly enough, gentlemen, fellow tenant of this of the summit at Las Colinas is the college football playoffs offices. All right, uh, and in addition to that, just across the street are the offices of the Big Twelve Conference. So the American has basically become this uh, southern-based football conference with uh, everything taking place. Um, basketball, obviously, uh, taking place in Fort Worth as well. Uh, some interesting, uh, you know, lunch conversations could be happening out there, right? Let's all go to Chili's and have some, uh, have some Chili? nachos and I talk about and, and talk and talk some business, eh? Big Twelve and uh, college football playoff. What do you say? Who's grabbing? Who's grabbing yeah. Chili for lunch in Texas? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Uh, well, well, let me let's 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 go to Murph, Google Maps you, and Murph, find out. Murph, if you were you were in Fort Worth for twenty hours, I'm sure you found better places in Fort Worth than Chili's in Fort Worth. No, no, this Texas. isn't. Listen, this isn't Fort Worth. This is Irving. Okay, this is a different place. I'm sure there's better food than Chili's in an Irving, Texas. There's but all due respect to Chili's, I like Chili's. But you know, if I was making the money that these Big Twelve you know, higher ups in the playoff. I, I don't think they're just settling for chilies. Anyway, I, I termed the future relationship. I don't know. Uh, again, I don't know if the CFP offices and the AAC offices are on the same floor. I believe the AAC offices are on the third floor of the building. Uh, I, I said that they will be having great hallway sex. And for those of you who don't know, <laughs> I'm you like, that, that. yeah, when I saw that, you my eyebrow raised a little. I'm like, uh, Murph. You should know what that is. I don't. You don't know what that is? No. I, I actually took it literally for a second. I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I could tell you what it is, but we'd have to like use we'd have to use the 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 drop button again, like we did when Higgins. Please got- no, please no. That's all right. <laughs> We're 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 good on that. Let's just move along. Let's move let's along. let's just oh, let's just let's just term it discussions. Uh, in, in the hallway, at, you know, at lunch at uh, well, there's a Chipotle right down the street. I kind of feel like it's going to be the equivalent to like the New York area when David Letterman was doing his show, and then like Seth Meyers or Jimmy Fallon was doing in the twelve thirty block. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, we're in the same building, but we're doing different things. Well, I, I well, I still think that you know, I, I it's an interesting coincidence, don't you think? I mean, hey, you know, the Big Twelve offices are right. Hey, let's, hey guys, let's go, let's go hop across the uh, are, John are W. Carpenter like, Freeway and. Uh, are, you, are you trying to like stir up a realignment here, expansion? Yeah, hey, you never know. Or? I don't know. It's, it's, you know, it seems like you know if Texas and Oklahoma decide to uh, 
fly the coop. You know, there's some other some other uh, options might be afoot. I don't know. May, that wouldn't be too bad, don't you think? I don't think they're coming to the America. No, I don't think Texas yeah. and Oklahoma are just going. No, hey, no, 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 no. I'm not. No, no, no. I'm not saying. I haven't. I've never said that. I don't believe that would be the case. But I'm saying if they if they decided to leave, the other schools might be like, hey, American. Yeah. Sweet. Maybe That's what not. we want. Leftovers. West Virginia. Yeah. Texas Tech. Yeah. yeah. Why not? Well, hopefully, let's just get through this pandemic first. Then we'll worry about conferences at that point. I'll just be very glad to have that conversation down the road when we're not stuck wondering if we will have any sports to talk about at all. Fair point. Fair point. And on that note, let's wrap it up. Wait, wait. I promise Murph. No baseball. Come on. There is some UCF baseball news, Murph. Major League Baseball teams released most of them, right? 60-man rosters. Explain that. And there's three UCF guys that were mentioned, uh, among others, weren't they? Yes, yeah, so uh, baseball season will start here in the next few weeks. So in, in in leading up to that, teams have released their 60-man player pools. These are basically the rosters you will use uh, to sort of supply your team if anything goes wrong. This is basically also a place where minor leaguers can, get, can still get instruction. That's why a lot of these guys are in the pool anyway, not because they're going to play in the majors, but because they those teams want like their high-end prospects – to be working out at the like nearby facilities. So, you know, this is also part of the fact that minor league baseball was canceled officially yesterday. So a lot of guys, maybe, maybe all guys who are in that 60, man, 60 or are not, or are not in that 60 man player pool. If you're not in there, you don't know what your baseball future is. So if you're in the 60 man player pool, at least you come to camp, uh, you can work out the facilities uh, and they kind of keep an eye on you and you can get some instruction. However, yes, they released the pools. Three UCF players are on these pools. You have Dylan Moore, uh, the middle in, the middle infielder for the uh, Seattle Mariners. You uh, you have Drew Butera, still around. I believe this is year ten for Drew in the, at yep. major league level. He'll be uh, catching for the Colorado Rockies, and Bo Taylor is now catching on the Cleveland Indians. Those three players, uh, and, but for other guys like we talked about, maybe you know Jeffrey Hakinson. I, I don't know. He's a guy who you know like like the rest of the guys in minor league baseball has to find something to do. Will that mean going to independent ball for a bit? Uh, what happens in fall ball? Is that even a thing this year? Maybe not. Winter ball? Maybe not. So it really leaves a lot of guys uh, up in the air with their baseball futures. So that's why you see these 60-man rosters filled out, not only so that these teams have a big pool of players they can choose from, but those players will at least get some instruction from their home teams. That's good. That so, is wild. That, that is, is pretty wild. That is pretty pretty bizarre I, you know, I'm gonna say, obviously tremendously sad for all the minor leaguers out there who are out of a job for a year and they're, they're, and who knows what minor league baseball is going to look like for a lot of guys you know former UCF guys um, who had who had jobs in the minors uh, with especially with the new professional baseball agreement um, that's still I, Murph that still has yet to be finished off right so we don't know what yeah, it's going to look like in 2021. We have a CBA expiring after the 2021 season in in November. Oh, fabulous! <laughs> so it's gonna be great again. We're gonna go, we're gonna go this again, but with more with, with more long term ramifications. It's gonna be great. Uh, yeah, you know there are there are if guys you're into if you're expect- into if you're into sports labor disputes, ladies and gentlemen, oh, 2021 man. is your year. <laughs> Look, if you like if you like sports, you probably shouldn't watch baseball. But if you like sports labor, <laughs> baseball is the sport for you because that's all we do now. We talk about labor. Um, uh, look, before this whole thing, before the minor leagues were canceled, uh, a ton of minor league guys were basically just cut from their teams. Uh, there was a huge like swath of guys who basically went unannounced, but they're no, they're no longer on teams. I don't know if UCF players are involved in that. And also, yeah, when we get out of this pandemic, minor league baseball will not look the same. We'll have – We'll probably be down at least 40 teams in like short season, low low level minor league ball. Those teams will not will no longer exist. Basically, and, an entire level of minor league baseball is getting eliminated, right? Yeah. So anyway, we talked about this with with Kylie McDaniel a few weeks ago. If you want to go back in the in the podcast archives, ESPN Baseball Insider and UCF alum, we talked about what the impact would be there. But uh, yeah, it's a sad time still, even with baseball on the horizon. Now, guys reporting to camp uh, today on July 1st. 
it's still it's it's a bleak day for baseball because you've got thousands of other players, not to mention the people that work at these parks, the broadcasters, the media, the fans. They're all out of it too. So, so um, it's it, it, even when baseball, even when there's something positive to say about baseball, like there is today, like players are reporting to their home stadiums. Baseball still gives still finds a way to give you some awful news, and uh, that seems to be the uh, the 2020 year. Yes. Thanks a lot. Best of, luck to, best of luck to Dylan Moore and Bo Taylor and, and Drew Butera. I am not sure. I, I, would, I would assume that uh, that uh, Dylan Moore is the most likely guy to get real playing time, uh, not only because uh, – well, mostly because the Mariners are not good and there's a spot for him. Uh, but, but really oh, – oh. Well, that's a ringing <laughs> endorsement. <laughs> Sorry, serious. Dylan, if you're listening, we still love you. Come on, really Murph, do. it's a 60-game schedule. Everybody's got a shot. Come on. The reason why you, a guy like Bo Taylor gets on here is because there's more catchers being added on. Because in a normal season, teams go through four or five catchers at the at least. Um, so you need to add a lot of catchers. So again, parents, if you're if you want your son to become a baseball player, make them a catcher because th- that at least gives them a leg up over anything else. If you want to know why Drew Butera is playing in year ten in the majors while being really one of the worst hitters of, uh, of this past decade, it's because he's really good at catching and talking to pitchers. Like, that sort of safety gives him a leg up. And so that, that's the reason why he's here. That's the reason why he's still here. It's not because he can't. It's not because he can hit. It's because he can catch. And that's a versatile position. People need catchers. So that's why you see a guy like Bo Taylor gets a call too because uh, these teams, you know, not only dealing with just normal – injuries that happen to catchers all the time but obviously with the coronavirus hanging over everybody's head uh we need we need more depth so you see more catchers get called up drew butera and i are also the same age so that makes me happy that he's still out wow. there so makes all me right, believe so, i still have a shot i love that drew butera is gonna end up getting a, a he might already be there uh no he's not quite yet but he might end up playing long enough to get like lifetime pension from major league baseball i mean that's that i mean he's close to getting 10 10 years 10 full years of service time um, and again, I, I, I rag on his offensive abilities, um, but it, he's won but a World he, Series and he's caught no hitters in the American and the National League. Only guy to do he's, that, he's, right? He, he, I don't know if he's the only man to do that, but uh, but oh, certainly fifth, it, fifth catcher to do that. Sorry, anyway, it's been on. an amazing career for him, and it's still going in Colorado. So I, I do think that you know certainly Drew. I would not expect Drew to start in Colorado, but he's there because catchers, you know, catchers have uh, get get a. Uh, they're they're specialized. They're heavily they're they're, right. they're 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 like the last they're they're like the last specialized offensive player in baseball. By the let way, me uh, counter, let me I want to counter that though because uh, first of all, Trupe Chair might be the and I could be wrong on this. Jeff, correct me on this if I'm wrong. Is he might be the only active UCF athletic Hall of Famer that's playing in the states? I know Alini Reyes who got inducted last year. She's playing over in Europe. Uh, but I think he might be the only active UCF Athletic Hall of Famer playing in a prof- in the uh, big league, in the big you know the big three, if you will, here in the states. You could correct me. I think if you're I'm right. I that. think you're right about that. Got to love that. Jermaine story. Taylor's, you know, obviously he would have been playing in big three. That's not happening this year. But yeah, uh, but, he's not in the Hall of Fame yet. But let so. me let me counter your point there, Murph, because this week on the Black and Gold of course, you've been seeing the unveilings of my top 100. UCF Knights male athletes of all time and the top 80 UCF female athletes of all time, part of our UCF 250 series. Make sure you check it out on blackandgobetterit.com. But if you saw my latest one with the males from 31 to 40, you would have seen Bo Taylor, who I ranked 39th because he was awesome at UCF. He hit 337. He only had five less guys thrown out than Drew Butera. He was just as good as Drew Butera defensively. He had a better bat, but yet he was a fifth-round pick from the Oakland A's in the 2011 draft, but he hasn't materialized in Major League Baseball even like Drew Butera did. Why? <laughs> because baseball is hard. <laughs> so, so listeners, Eric gave me that exact question during the week as like a lead-up to this, and I my response was, baseball's hard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think Drew, again, not, not taking anything away from him, but also he has been in the right spots at the right time. Um, I, 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 we shouldn't overshadow. I'm not sure Bo, Taylor, Bo Taylor's lineage, but we shouldn't overshadow the fact that that Drew's dad, Sal, still works in Major League Baseball um, a, a, as a coach, uh, or at least he did as a couple as of a couple years ago. That matters too. And I think Drew, once he gets up there, 
and pitchers sort of like he there's he I mean I think in his second year in the major leagues he caught a no hitter from Francisco Liriano. Right. Uh, he should right away how comfortable he was behind the plate in terms of uh, framing, also throwing runners out. He's got one of the he's got one of the strongest arms of any catcher in baseball because he can also pitch. I've seen that happen uh, at a Dodger game before. Um, so and, and there's a comfort there's a comfort level that he is that he has set with pitchers that I believe gives team a, a sense of ease. And then it's sort of like that. It's it's sort of like the 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 saying that you know you need experience. Well, how do you get experience? I get experience through experience. And so Bo Taylor, because he hasn't gotten the call up, is sort of seen as like, well, maybe he's not ready for it yet. I mean, again, his offensive stats aren't that great, but he hasn't gotten the chance yet. While Drew has gotten the chance, and because he's gotten the chance and done well with it in in spurts, as far as being a good defensive catcher, teams see that. And they like the reliability that he brings. They like the safety that he brings. He's a known quantity now. So that experience then leads him into more contracts and more years with teams. And so it's sort of it's a it's a it's a cycle. Well, hopefully Bo will get a few more shots uh, this this year with uh, with the Cleveland Indians. So it, it, he's, in the, he's in the major leagues right now. I, mean, right. I know it's a 60 man roster, but it's still. He's still part of the club. He's still at. I, and there's going to be a lot of there. I, I would be shocked if the if. If any team doesn't use all sixty players at least multiple times in the course of the season, I'd be shocked. Well, well the, right now most teams aren't even filled up to sixty. The Rays are. The Rays did fill out their sixty man roster to sixty, but like the Red Sox, uh, who I was kind of watching for Thad Ward. I know Thad has been really good in their system. Uh, you know, the Red Sox only have forty seven players on their sixty man. That's because you want to add guys as as this camp goes along. Maybe you trade for some guys or sign someone else. Uh, and add them to your roster. So a lot of teams haven't filled up their 60 men all the way to leave them some flexibility to add guys later on. And so maybe that'll happen with some other UCF guys. Uh, I don't know, but you know, you look at it, you look at a guy like Bo Taylor. I, I talk about how you know he he's only there for for insurance. Well, the Indians are carrying only four catchers, and again, I say only four uh, because again, in a normal season, teams use at least that. I think. The last team we had use only two catchers, I think, was 2016, was the Giants when they had Buster Posey. Right. Uh, so it's very rare for teams to use, uh, you know, three or fewer catchers. So, and in this in this climate, you could certainly team, you could certainly see a team if things break right or wrong for others, uh, where Bo gets a shot as the fourth catcher because uh, it's a really uh, arduous position, and we are in a climate where guys could strain hamstrings easily because they're not fully ramped up uh, and also get contract the virus, which would put them out of commission as well. Yeah. Uh, it should be, uh, it should be a pretty, uh, pretty interesting way how these teams actually shuffle through their rosters. If that means more UCF guys get a shot and get more shots, I'm all for it. So, um, all right, let's wrap it up here. Uh, Eric and Brian, you can follow them at Eric Lopez, Elo and spokes, underscore murphy we got a bunch of stuff coming this week it's rivalry week on uh sb nation so we got some rivalry related pieces coming your way we have of course our continuing ucf 250 rolling on through uh, trying to get to the uh trying to get through the uh the top uh half of the uh, male and female athletes and then we're also going to get to some coaches uh later on uh next week as well um for uh, all of us here at black and gold banneret including the newest member of our staff, guys. Daniela Medina has joined us. It's official as of tonight. Welcome aboard, Daniela. You'll be reading some of her stuff, uh, as well as uh, plenty more from uh, all of our writers and content producers here at Black and Gold Banneret uh, as the week uh, and the months continue. Hopefully, we'll have more sports to write about, too. So, everybody, wear those masks and social distance, please. Football season is at stake. We beg of you. Uh, for all of us here at Black and Gold Banneret, thank you so much for listening. This has been Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. We will catch you next week.